Good morning, everybody. Um, our program will start around nine, but in the meantime, um, just to give our panelists and, and um, each, each of you an idea of who's joining us, it'd be nice to, in the chat, drop in where you're joining us from. There are people from around the country that are, are logging in, and it's not only folks in the Seattle metropolitan area. So if um, help us out and, and drop your location in the chat. So I'm seeing our, our cousins from the east side of the state. A lot of folks from within the region, Connecticut. Excellent. We can see who's the farthest away. So far I'm seeing DC and, and Boston. So those are pretty far from our neck of the woods. Boise, Lakewood. Excellent. So Michaela, let's, uh, while people are putting their, their locations in the chat, let's run that, that first poll. If you can pull that up. So it's a pretty st straightforward question. question. And um, so if you could indicate why you're interested in TOD, uh, transit oriented development, um, and you can um, choose as many as you like, but let's give you a minute or so to um, select what's your primary interest in TOD. And Michaela, you can let me know when we seem to have um, a critical mass of, of responses. I'm going to end the poll. Excellent. So look at, look at looking at that. That's interesting. Largely work related. A lot of folks this morning um, are engaged in TOD in some way through their jobs. Uh, a few folks, five so far, live in a transit-oriented development area. That's great. Um, a lot of folks are also seeing um, TODs being developed around, around their, their neighborhoods. And so a lot of growing interest in the topic, particularly in our region. For those of you outside of the region, we're pretty excited in the Seattle area. We um, opened up a few new stations on our primary, our, our existing light rail line that really opened up a um, large part of, of the city and actually the region to um, our, our rail network. In fact, last night um, I went to the Seahawks game, terrible um, result, unfortunately, but it was jam packed. And um, I live in Capitol Hill, which is midway through the line, and it was full when the train got to me. So a lot of folks accessing the system from the north part of the city and the north part of the region. So. Why don't we move to the, the next question, uh, Michaela? So second question, what do you think is the biggest promise of transit-oriented development? And this time you can only choose one. I'll give you a minute or so. In the meantime, looking at um, other participants, we have folks from Maryland, folks from the north part um, of our region here in the Seattle region. We have members from a uh, representative of the Tulalip tribe, Lake Stevens. This is great, Salem, Oregon. And let's look at some results. So looking at housing seems to be the um, number one promise. We're certainly counting on it. Our regional growth strategy adopted about just about a year ago um, has the goal of accommodating 65% of housing and 75% of jobs in close proximity to high capacity transit. Um, and that in our region is of course the, the rail network um, that we're developing, commuter rail, uh, but also bus rapid transit are important uh, transit modes in our region and offer the promise of accommodating housing close to it, um, as well as our ferry system and the ferry terminal areas. So density in those places, more housing, um, close to jobs and services, and that connectivity is something that we're banking on. It looks like uh, the majority of you are, are uh, agreeing with that as well. That's excellent. So as more folks log on, um, what we're doing in the chat right now is just asking you to 
put in your location um, so that we can see and you can see where for folks are joining us from. We have people from all over the country, which is exciting. Um, and so that's just a fun thing to see. Let's look and see Boise, Idaho, um, Fort Myers, Florida. That may very well be, I think in miles, the farthest away. So you may be the winner, Jorge, um, but we'll see. No prizes, unfortunately. Um, but we have Maryland, North Seattle, Bothell, our friends down in Tacoma, Madison, Wisconsin, Houston. This is great. Bellingham, Tacoma, um, and, and Jorge, yes, you get to brag all day, all weekend that you were the furthest from <laughs> Seattle in today's call. Michaela, let's um, do the, the, the last poll. Okay, third and last one is what do you think the biggest challenge is that we're gonna be talking about challenges a lot today, um, but if this also is a single choice and the, those choices are keeping the housing in and transit oriented development affordable, uh, addressing community concerns. Our second panel this morning is about community led TOD and um, how do you incorporate those community concerns. Um, ensuring BIPOC communities benefit from public and, and private investment is a key goal that we have in our regional plan, and it's a, certainly a challenge. Um, and then also challenges with developing and, and, and financing regulations. Absolutely. Complicate, these projects can be complicated, multiple financing sources, um, and really hard to put together sometimes. So, Michaela, are we seeing... Let's give it another little bit before we close this third question. We have a little bit of time. So again, looking at our participants, some more folks from around the region. Again, if you're just joining us, just for fun, we're having uh, participants put their locations in the chat so that you all can see um, who's joined us this morning. Our friends in it. Issaquah and Everett, uh, Tukwila, Mount Lake Terrace, Mill Creek, Pierce County. Hi, Amy. Amy in Tacoma, good friend of PSRC. Ah, we have we have an alternate um, response um, to our poll question as well. Lack of consistency in zoning rules for each municipality on TOD lines. Absolutely, we're looking at. Uh, I forget exactly what the, the count is, but these long corridors in our region that we're developing um, cross multiple jurisdictions. And um, that's hard then for developers and other folks to, to, to negotiate, um, having to kind of reinvent the wheel, wheel every time they, they cross boundaries. Okay, let's close this question and see what our results are because we're getting up on the hour. So again, the question, what do you think the biggest challenge for TODs um, are? Our biggest challenges could be uh, keeping housing in TODs affordable um, is the, has the, the plurality, uh, addressing community concerns related to de density, um, followed by ensuring BIPOC communities benefit um, from public and private investments and there isn't displacement um, and then regulatory challenges. Um, and so there's a there's some there's a question and an answer in the chat about uh, we are going to be closing the chat um, so that we can really focus our attention on speakers um, as soon as we begin the program at 9 a.m. So um, that's the way we're approaching us this morning. Okay. Well, all of these topics in the questions um, will be addressed at some level um, this morning, and so really looking forward to our, our panelists. Um, and we have, a, I'll give this about 30 seconds or so until we kick it off um, to Patience Malaba, who is a, uh, one of the co-chairs of PSRC's newly uh, reformed uh, Regional Transit Oriented Development Committee. Um, one thing I'll say, maybe just before I turn it over to Patience, is that we recognized at PSRC, both, both at the staff, but also most importantly at the board level, our elected officials and other board members, the real critical importance of transit oriented development to the region's future, uh, leveraging the 
um, upwards of $100 billion of transit investment that this region is making over the next 30 years is uh, of critical importance. And our board, uh, our growth management policy board in particular, wanted a, um, a, a committee that could really focus and get down in the weeds on um, how do we implement TOD? How do we make sure that we're developing in this region in the right way? So um, really thrilled uh, to turn this over to our co-chairs um, of this Regional Transit Oriented Development Committee. They met for the first time in September, had a great kickoff meeting. Um, and so Patience Malaba, um, with the co-chair of, of the committee, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Ben. Good morning, everyone. We are just thrilled you could join us this morning. As introduced, I am Patience Malaba, co-chair of PSRC's Regional TOD Committee and Director of Government Relations and Policy at the Housing Development Consortium of Seattle King County. Happy to have this virtual event to explore innovative techniques, best practices, and learn from national research and local work on building thriving, sustainable, and equitable transit-oriented development. We have a fun and exciting day ahead of us with a lineup of great speakers, panels, and walking tours later on in the day. But I wanna begin with talking about why we're here today. And I'll start off the day with a little bit of history to demonstrate how far we have come as a region. For those of you who may not be familiar with the growing transit community strategy, and I know so many of you, as I've seen your names here, were a part of developing that strategy, which was an effort that the region began almost a decade ago to emphasize the importance of high capacity transit station areas in accommodating growth and local communities throughout the region. It was supported by a federal sustainable communities initiative grant, which was awarded by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, a broad partnership came together, which included public private and non-governmental stakeholders to imagine the future of the region's transit corridors and to come to some common agreement about the role of transit corridors in our region. Coming out of that collaboration and partnership were some key goals that we agreed upon. And I want to just uh, underscore a few that we emphasized. The first one being attracting growth in transit corridors. The second one being preserving and creating housing affordability. I think we saw this being demonstrated even in the polls that you just all participated in, uh, the prioritization of not only preserving, but creating housing affordability as we grow as a region. And alongside that, ensuring access to opportunity for all of our region's residents in transit corridors, which remains a priority even to this day. And since the growing transit community strategy was adopted in 2014, the voters and decision makers in the central Puget Sound region uh, have committed to make extraordinary investments, generous investments in high capacity transit. Uh, ben mentioned earlier that we are in the upwards of $100 billion investments in our high capacity transit station areas. PSRC has worked over the last two years to update our region's long range uh, growth management plan, which is required, of course, under the state's growth management uh, act, which is in our local region, Vision 2050. Within Vision 2050, high capacity transit station areas, the cities and communities that will host them have been identified as critically important uh, in terms of accommodating growth as we look out to house and employ 1.8 million people who will be moving to our region by 2050 and 1.2 million jobs which are forecast to be uh, 
expected in our region over the same period of time. About 65% of that housing has to be in proximity to transit and 75% of those jobs also has to be in proximity to transit. That means we have a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that our systems are set up such that we can see the reality of this vision over the next few years. And also ensure that we can really support communities to be successful as they experience this growth to ensure that the benefits that come with the growth uh, from transit-oriented development are really accrued to all people who are living in those communities. And we know that we can only do that if we're working together. It's going to take all of us coming together to make that vision a reality. And we look forward to working with all of you who will be a part of that important work to achieve this ambitious vision that the region has laid out for its own future. And with that, before, I before we introduce the panel of the day, which is the first panel of the day, a little bit of housekeeping for all of you. If you have a logistical question during the webinar, please use the chat feature and the PSRC staff will be happy to help you. If you have a question for the panelists, please use the Q&A feature uh, to ask your question. If you've registered for an afternoon uh, walking tour and you have questions, please reach out to Kristen Mitchell, who can have, who's happy to help you as well. Her contact information will be shared uh, later this morning. With that said, I would like to go ahead and hand back over to Ben Bacanter, who is the Director of Regional Planning at PSRC, to introduce our first panel of the day. So over back to you, Ben. Great. Thank you, Patience, and, and thank you for setting up the conversation this morning with such great context. Um, I have the real privilege of introducing a friend to PSRC, um, Maria Zimmerman. Uh, we have a long history with Maria, who actually was integral to the um, HUD Sustainable Communities Initiative that patients mentioned and which supported such foundational work in our region um, and brought us to where we are today. And so Maria graciously uh, agreed to, uh, to moderate the, the first panel which is focused on more national issues. And so Maria is the principal and founder of MZ Strategies, uh, which, and she is a seasoned veteran of shaping organizational change and entrepreneurship. She opened Reconnecting America's Washington DC office and served as its vice president for policy. Uh, Maria was a founding member and interim director of, the, of Trans Transportation for America and served as deputy director of the Office of Sustainable Housing and Communities uh, which, as I mentioned, um, managed the establishment of a $250 million grant program with, within the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And as I mentioned, was um, so helpful in advancing um, equitable transit-oriented development in the Central Puget Sound region. Um, Maria also spent six years on Capitol Hill working in the office of Congressman Earl Blumenauer, who, um, as many of you know, is a, a great friend of transit and transit-oriented development. So with that introduction, I'd love to um, thank again and turn over um, the, the screen to Maria. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Patience, for your comments. It is great to be with you all today. Uh, I wish I was there in person, uh, as your region is one of my favorite places in the whole country to be, and I know you're celebrating a uh, new light rail extension opening as well. So um, excited for the tours that are happening later today. Wish I wish again, I could be with you for those. Um, so I am excited to be joined today by uh, three terrific folks who we all kind of in different ways have been watching and weighing in um, on federal transportation issues and policy issues. And it's much more than transportation. It cuts across housing, EPA, many different parts uh, of the administration. So I will pull up, I have just a, a couple of slides to kind of help us set the context. And then what we'll do is we'll hear uh, some kind of introductory comments from each of our 
three panelists, and then we will go into some facilitated discussion and definitely want this to be an engaging uh, conversation with you all. So please do feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box and we will have time uh, during our discussion to get to those. So um, thinking about equitable transit oriented development and kind of where we're at at this point of time, um, there's a lot of unknowns and, and in some ways there's just a tremendous amount of promise and opportunity and things that make me very excited as someone who's worked on transit oriented development issues for over 20 years now. Uh, but there's still some big hurdles, some big question marks um, and, and a lot of uh, variables that I think collectively we hopefully can help to shape um, what's, what's moving at the federal level. Uh, some discussions around um, transportation funding. If, if you've been following the news, you've been hearing a lot about uh, President Biden's Build Back Better agenda, which includes um, historic levels of investment in infrastructure, of which housing is explicitly called out and defined and embraced as part of infrastructure in that, as well as the caring economy. So thinking about things like childcare and workforce development and other things, again, we see within actual TODs, how all of these pieces come together. TOD is much more than just the built infrastructure, it's the human infrastructure as well. So a lot of questions where that agenda will ultimately play out. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, I'm, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists kind of in, in their opening sort of what they think is ultimately gonna happen. Um, there's the bipartisan infrastructure bill um, that passed the Senate. The House was supposed to vote on it last week. They sort of kicked the can on that. Lots of uh, discussions as that's kind of become a point of, um, of a pressure point in negotiations around the budget and reconciliation. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, if, if you don't follow this all closely, was created um, by a group of 10 senators. Uh, most of those senators are actually not on relevant transportation committees, um, but they included in that infrastructure proposal, the Senate Environment and Public Works, um, basically the, their, their highway or their surface transportation authorization. Uh, the Senate Banking Committee, which does transit, had not provided a bill yet. So um, that created this interesting dynamic where folks in the House who had passed a transportation bill that was very progressive and really included uh, significant investments, not only in transit, but also in climate change and explicitly had several provisions that addressed issues that some of us uh, raised in the polls around affordable housing and transit and TOD and how important it was. Actually, would have, the House bill would have created an office of transit-oriented communities. That House proposal is not in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And this is part of the ongoing um, issues we've seen played out with this reconciliation process around the budget of trying to get some of those policy changes, so those progressive elements, additional funding for things like uh, transit operating, climate investments, um, not just on the transportation side, but also looking at things like climate resiliency in stormwater, uh, energy efficiencies, and significant investments in that reconciliation bill around housing. So this sets up a curious dynamic, one that actually uh, is very unique in the history of Congress, where um, these two bills have kind of been playing uh, in different ways than traditionally bills are done. And so uh, as we saw just yesterday, the Senate um, approved to, to push the, the, the deficit budget issues to December 3rd, hopefully to give a little bit more time. Uh, everyone's saying that we can work out the reconciliation and the infrastructure package. So long story short, there could be a lot of money for infrastructure uh, or things could all kind of collapse and we wouldn't see that. Nonetheless, we did have in the American Rescue Plan a lot of new money that's coming into communities now for things like emergency rental assistance, for business relief, for infrastructure, for transit, uh, operating assistance and other things. So lots moving, questions around kind of what exactly the piece of pie for ETOD will be ultimately. We, we don't know that today, we'll have to wait and see. Um, there are also though, in addition to kind of the congressional funding side, 
there's a lot of activities that are happening with the administration. Uh, early, uh, within the first week in office, President Biden uh, issued several executive orders, which are really important, centering their priorities around climate change, around racial equity, and uh, agencies are working together, and we'll hear more about this around something called Justice 40, which is really to ensure um, that uh, funding is targeted and supporting uh, traditionally marginalized, distressed uh, communities, communities of color. Um, so a lot of work is underway in the administration to really figure out how to implement and what action on those executive orders will look like. Um, I think it was today that the uh, administration released a climate action plan for multiple different agencies. So again, lots is happening. Good time to talk with folks in the administration. And then uh, timing. Um, the clock is ticking and at the federal level, folks are always thinking about the next election, always thinking about the next deadline. Uh, the transportation reauthorization did expire on September 30th and we're now in the first of what may be many continuing resolutions, depending on what happens with the infrastructure funding. And uh, again, thinking about the next set of elections, both for Congress as well as for the Senate and for the White House. So that's kind of our context. Lots of things in flux, lots of things potentially in play, lots of opportunities that hopefully we can take advantage uh, and hopefully we don't miss out on. So with that as backdrop, I'll ask uh, our three super panelists to kind of come on and join us here. And we're gonna hear first off um, from Dr. Um, Murteza Farajan, who is with the Build America Bureau at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, and I, I'm really excited to have him join us here today. Um, the Build America Bureau uh, is really the part of U.S. DOT that's focused with supporting innovative financing. And I know in the Seattle region, that's been very important and instrumental for you in building out uh, the, the light rail transit expansions. Um, but also the agency has been thinking about how they can position themselves to better support transit-oriented development through some of that innovative financing work. Uh, and Dr. Farajan um, is from my state or had worked last in my state in Virginia, where he also was with the Department of Transportation leading up um, the Commonwealth's work around innovative public-private partnerships. Uh, so um, I will turn it to you, Doctor, to, to fill us in on what's happening at the Build America Bureau uh, and, and what um, kind of opportunities might be for TOD, and then we'll, we'll keep the conversation rolling. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, good morning to everyone on the West Coast, and good afternoon to those folks who are on the East Coast like I am. Um, I'm actually in Richmond, so still in, uh, in, in Virginia, uh, but as you said, um, uh, it, it, it has been about three years that I am working as executive director of Build America Bureau at USDOT. Um, so my office is in Washington, D.C., but uh, we really uh, work with all different states. And one of the first things that I did after I joined the Bureau was to make sure that uh, I get out of Washington, D.C., travel myself to different states, sit down with folks, especially at local level and try to explain to them what opportunities we can provide to them. Because uh, Bureau, as I will just explain to you in just a few minutes, uh, it has a lot of powerful tools that um, they have not been fully utilized in the past, simply because a lot of people either don't know about them or they don't know how to use them. And that's one of the goals that we have to make sure that we participate in events like this to explain to people that what is available and how they can take advantage of it. Uh, Seattle is actually a region that has uh, taken advantage of our uh, products a lot. Uh, I'm pretty sure that folks are familiar with Sound Transit. Sound Transit is probably the largest borrower of um, uh, our known products, uh, especially our TFIA program. Uh, we just refinanced a $3.4 billion or $3.3 billion loan for Sound Transit that saved them hundreds of millions of dollars. And we gave them a new loan for a new project that they're building, about $500 million, if I remember the numbers right. But, but that puts a package at $3.8 billion. And that's the largest loan package we have ever approved uh, within our programs. We have two main credit programs. Uh, one of them is called TIFIA, and the other one is called REF. Let me just quickly explain what's the difference between the two. And we have TOD provisions under both of these programs. Uh, RIF is mainly for rail projects, for example, Amtrak. 
uh, passenger rail projects uh, or freight rail projects, they can borrow uh, from a RIF program. Uh, class one, class two, class three um, uh, rail companies, they can all borrow. We have about $35 billion capacity on the RIF and both TIFI and RIF can provide loans that are at treasury rates. We're talking about today's rate is 2% for a 35 year fixed rate. Um, and they come with a lot of flexibilities. That's why a lot of borrowers love them because uh, assuming that for example, designing a project, building a project is going to take about five years from the time that they close a loan for our borrower their first payment could be delayed until five years after the initial five years when they complete the project. So that gives them about 10 years to make the first payment. So for a lot of projects similar to TOD projects that a borrower wants to make a huge upfront investment and then over time operate the project and have revenues to pay back that loan, these are very powerful tools. They can be prepaid without any penalty at any time. They can be refinanced. Uh, similar to what we did for Sound Transit. And uh, they come with a lot of other benefits on the financial side that I'm not gonna get into that. I know that uh, uh, our, our, our financial uh, gurus would love to hear about how we can structure these financial models in a way that can save borrowers a lot more than what otherwise they would save with bonds or, uh, or uh, 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 loans from banks. But I will just stop there and, 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 and uh, for RIF and, and move now to TIFIA. As I said, very similar, but TIFIA is for Oops, I think we may have lost Dr. Farjan. Hopefully he can sign back in. Uh Am Are I back good? now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, great, great. Sorry for, for internet, sometimes it's a spotty. But TIFIA, unlike uh, RIF, can finance other types of improvements, such as highway, such as uh, 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 ports, some some airport terminals, uh, some some transit projects, and again, very very powerful tool that can be used. Under both of these programs, we have a TOD language, and there is a difference. Under TIFIA, we can finance public infrastructure, so anything that would be considered public infrastructure. And by the way, a couple of months earlier, we issued guide guidance, which is available on our website and explains exactly what are the eligibility criteria. Uh, but under TIFIA, public infrastructure such as any facility, any building that can be used publicly can be built, sidewalks, roadways, uh, uh, any venues that are public venues, uh, they can be financed, even vertical infrastructure with our TIFIA TOD. We actually have one, uh, one, one, one project again in, 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 uh, in, in an area that is not far away from you, Belrid, uh, has a loan about $100 million from us uh, that, uh, that they have used to uh, finance a uh, street network project. Under RIF, we can go a little bit even further. We can finance real estate development, whether it's commercial, whether it's residential, as long as that real estate development is close to a rail station and it's physically and functionally related to that rail station. There are a couple of criteria in the, uh, in the legislation that, that uh, the borrower needs to uh, qualify for it, but we can finance up to 75% of the cost of, of the project. These programs have been around for quite a while. They were actually added in our legislation as part of FAST Act about six years ago. However, they have not been fully utilized. This is one of the areas that in the past we have not really issued a lot of loans. As a matter of fact, I don't think we have any TOD loan that we have issued in the past. The reason that we issued guide, guidelines uh, back in, I believe it was April of this year, was to focus on these programs and make sure that folks are aware of them and we can actually have more TOD projects that we can finance. Since then, we have seven projects that we have added to our project development phase. And there are about four projects that we are talking to different borrowers right now that hopefully would reach that project development phase soon. 
One of the things that we provide is technical assistance. And these projects that I just mentioned, the seven that is in project development or the other four that is about to enter our project development phase, we are working very closely with project borrowers to help them really share our information with them, help them through the uh, maze that they have to go through, you know, that how difficult sometimes it is to go through different uh, federal requirements and get their projects ready to apply for the loan. We have in-house people, in-house experts, experts who can uh, sit down with them, uh, talk to them about eligibility criteria, and really help them to maximize the benefits of their loans. They sit down with them and try to, uh, to come up with the maximum that they can borrow based on uh, revenues that they have. And these are loans, by the way, not grants. So they need to be, pre uh, they need to be paid back over time. Um, so that's, that's the technical assistance part that as part of that, we have a couple of mini programs that I want to mention a couple of them really quickly because again, another, pro, uh, another pro project sponsor or, uh, or entity that is in your region and has already got uh, some funding from us under our regional infrastructure accelerator program uh, could possibly be a good example. Pacific Northwest Economic Region is one of the five recipients of that grant program, this is the grant program that in particular, we are uh, giving out to accelerators, regional accelerators who would work on project development activities, working with different project sponsors, helping them understand the concepts of project finance, because a lot of folks are more familiar with project funding. That's how they have been doing their projects in the past. They may not be as familiar about project finance and how they can borrow to build their projects. And these regional accelerators, which by the way, right now is just a demonstration program. I'm hoping that uh, Congress would give us more money. The first round was $5 million. We have another $5 million that we will probably put a note for it in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we will award it uh, shortly after that. Uh, but $10 million in about one year, we know that that's not enough to go into planning uh, activities related to projects who want to actually get ready to borrow from us. In the new legislation, there are new provisions that we have that would give us a little bit more uh, resources that we can provide, because we do understand that it is really important for those who are not familiar with these concepts, especially borrowing project finance, to have access to the resources that they need to have. Right now, as I mentioned earlier, we provide the technical assistance through the Bureau. We provide workshops, we answer their questions, we are developing some learning material that we're going to put on our websites. We do have dedicated staff that if you have questions, you can call us and we will pair you with one of our experts and that would basically walk you through the process and answer your questions for you. Hopefully in the past, we will be in a position that we can even provide some consulting services, not directly through us, but other consultants that then we can pay for their services through the grants that I was just talking about. But that is something that's in the new legislation. We need to wait for until that legislation is passed. And hopefully, if it stays in the legislation, that's something we'll be able to provide in the future. Um, overall, we have about $100 billion lending capacity. So we don't have any shortage of lending capacity. These programs right now are not competitive. Uh, like some of the grant programs that when you apply, uh, you don't know whether you're going to get it or not. If you have a project that is credit worthy and it's eligible to receive a loan, we have a process that you need to go through it. But you know that if you go through that process at the end of the, uh, this tunnel, if everything looks good, there is money available to be allocated to your project. Um, so I will just stop there. I know that I, 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 I shared a lot of information, a lot of numbers and details that maybe each one of them requires a little bit more time to, to dig into the, uh, uh, into the details a little bit more and, 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 and talk uh, about them. If there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to explain or clarify any parts of uh, what I just explained. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and, and I'll plant a question that hopefully we'll have a chance to chat about, which is, uh, I know I'm curious, uh, again, we had a lot of um, folks on the call here who are interested in affordable housing as part of TOD. And so uh, maybe in the discussion time, just to plant this seed, thinking about whether and how projects that um, are largely or have a, a significant portion of affordable housing that's part of them, uh, are those kinds of projects things that can be eligible, eligible for some of this innovative financing? Or are you really looking more at higher end market rate? So keep that in mind. Um, and, and maybe that's a good pivot to 
uh, talking about affordable housing, and I'm excited to have Mike Kingsella with us, um, who, who will talk a little bit. HUD, I think, is a really important partner in this work, and a lot of times, uh, I, I know we kind of focus in on the transit, the T side of TOD, which absolutely we need to have that to make it work. Um, but as um, Anne has noted in the chat, it's also thinking about those first mile, last mile connections. It's thinking about reconnecting neighborhoods and communities. It's thinking about access to opportunity and broader mobility. Absolutely, some of that can come through DOT and I'm fingers crossed about some of the new programs that would do that if the infrastructure and the reconciliation bill were to pass um, that really explicitly call those pieces out. But the housing side is also really important. And we know right now where many communities are having a transit crisis, but even more so we're facing a, a housing affordability crisis. So um, Mike, I, I know uh, you have worked on these issues both in Portland, Oregon, where you originally hailed from and did a lot of work to um, start up for growth there at, within Oregon and working uh, as a member of LOCUS, um, the, a, a group of responsible developers. And then I've taken that work really nationally, both to think about how the federal transit program can do a better job of thinking about that linkage, but also thinking about some of the federal housing uh, programs and opportunities. So uh, Mike, we'll, we'll love to hear from you a little bit about your organization and, and sort of what you see those federal opportunities on. Great, Maria, thank you so much. And it's just such a pleasure to sit here with, uh, with esteemed co-panelists uh, from Build America um, uh, uh, Bureau um, and, and, and Khalil, who we'll hear from uh, momentarily. But, you know, as Maria shared, uh, I got my start uh, in the housing conversation in the transit-oriented development conversation um, by way of Smart Growth America's LOCUS uh, Coalition of Responsible Real Estate Developers and Investors. After that work locally out in Oregon, really saw the opportunity to focus on housing affordability and the housing shortage at a national level. And we formed uh, Up for Growth, uh, a national cross-sector member network focused on solving America's housing shortage uh, in April 2018 out here in Washington, DC. So um, like Dr. Uh, Far Farihan um, and, and Khalil, I'm out here in DC. Um, uh, very happy to be working on uh, structural policy issues at a national scale. Um, before I dive into um, some of the more specific uh, federal policy work that we're interested in, um, I'd like to just provide sort of our perspective on the issue. Um, you know, certainly from cities to suburbs, um, even to rural America, the cost of housing and demand for it has dramatically outpaced salaries and supply. Uh, today, far too many Americans cannot afford to live well uh, where they work, where they play, and, and where they gather. Um, you know, we all know that housing production uh, is not keeping up with community housing needs. Uh, things like artificial barriers, exclusionary zoning, and opposition from residents like NIMBYism combine um, to really create a severe underproduction of homes, a, a major driver of our affordability challenges nationwide. And these unjust policies really continue to drive working families, people with low incomes, and people of color out of high opportunity neighborhoods, places that are rich in jobs, infrastructure, and specifically transit. Um, and, and so I'll share, you know, when we launched this organization, one of the first reports we issued uh, was a report called Housing Under Production in the US. And we found that America had fallen short uh, to the tune of 7.3 million homes um, from 2000 to 2015. And that deficit or underproduction of, of needed housing um, has only gotten worse um, uh, since that time, since 2015, uh, due to the driving factors that I had mentioned. We also observed that this shortage um, is particularly acute um, in high opportunity and transit served locations. In fact, we ran a study looking at um, the past 10 years of New Start's funded uh, transit station areas. Um, and what we ultimately found was that, you know, you know, most of us on this call, I think, understand, you know, where you really expect and where you want density of housing and density of affordable housing is walkable to transit station areas, um, certainly as a uh, way to leverage 
um, significant investments in infrastructure, uh, fixed cost infrastructure, right? But also uh, to provide a housing plus transportation cost burdening reduction benefit um, for low income households for residents um, in these affordable communities. And so we found in those places where you would expect or want the density, the lion's share of transit agents, uh, transit uh, station areas are actually less dense um, than uh, even low density, brand new single family subdivisions. So if you look at the um, the population of transit station areas, I think the number was about 100, uh, excuse me, 410 station areas across the country. Um, and you ask the question, how many of those are less dense than the 90th percentile of density in their respective regions? Uh, the answer was 84%. Um, if you scaled that sort of density target uh, down to the 75th percentile of density, uh, we found that 60%, uh, well more than half of transit station areas are less dense than the 75th percentile of regional density. And so what that says to us is that in a world where we have a 7.3 million home under production, we have a lot of opportunity uh, to address that housing under production um, and drive more housing and particularly more affordable housing um, in transit served locations. There's a lot of capacity uh, for more TOD development, which is why um, that 2016 um, um, uh, 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 legislation that um, Dr. Farhan uh, mentioned around expanding TIFIA and RIF to fund transit oriented housing development uh, was so crucial, provides needed funding um, to increase the production of housing near transit. Uh, but there is so much more work to do uh, and that's really the focus of our organization. Um, I'll also share that like Smart Growth America, we believe that the status quo is unsustainable. If you look at the 7.3 million homes and you analyze different growth patterns or tra different trajectories of incentivizing homes, um, if you take a transit-oriented development approach, uh, you could use 25% of the land that would otherwise be consumed if we were to continue to build out housing under a more of the same approach. And of course that yields not only affordability benefits, uh, but it yields benefits in terms of the environment, uh, both, both consuming less land, but also uh, reducing traffic congestion and uh, greenhouse gas emissions out of cars, because we know that there's a correlation between the proximity folks live to transit um, and how many vehicle miles traveled those households are putting on the roads each and every day. Um, and, and so um, clearly um, there are a number of objectives, reasons um, to invest in leveraging uh, transit uh, to deliver needed housing. And the last thing I'll say just generally is that because we have such a scarcity um, of available land near transit, um, most of the housing that gets built is at the highest price points possible, right? So you have luxury housing often um, being developed um, where those residents are um, possibly not utilizing the transit infrastructure. And again, households that really rely on transit or would benefit from transit are priced out of those neighborhoods. So uh, we believe that this is not a problem unique to the, the Puget Sound region. It's not a problem that's unique to California or the West Coast or the East Coast. Our, our research shows housing under, under production is a nationwide crisis. It's a nationwide challenge that has to be addressed. And at the same time, as we implement climate um, uh, uh, strategies and invest more deeply in public transit infrastructure, we need to be thinking more holistically about how to build more transit oriented communities, delivering more housing affordability and more household affordability, combining housing and transit and transportation uh, cost savings. So um, Maria uh, shared a number of vehicles that are moving legislatively. Um, we are uh, actively uh, through Up for Growth Action, our advocacy affiliate organization, um, lobbying for specific policy prescriptions that really try to get at this housing under production problem near transit. And so I'll just walk through a few and then I would love to engage with the audience and Maria and our other panelists in, in a conversation about these policy prescriptions. Um, but, but first to the uh, bipartisan infrastructure uh, framework, um, the otherwise known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, 
which is stuck right now, but I believe will will move. Um, there was a provision um, that Senator Catherine Cortez Mastow uh, introduced um, called the Better Planning and Land Use for Affordable Neighborhoods Act, otherwise known as the Better Plan Act. And this bill um, we think is really important and impactful in that it will enable uh, communities through um, an existing framework and congestion management framework to work with MPOs to plan regionally, uh, regional strategies to um, increase affordable housing, uh, walkable to transit, otherwise, uh, in other words, align uh, transit planning and community development planning under one roof. Now, of course, PSRC uh, is doing a lot of good work already in this space, uh, but a lot of uh, comparable regions around the country aren't quite to the level that we see in Seattle or Portland, Oregon. Um, and so we think that this, um, this, this uh, framework and the funding that accompanies it uh, will provide uh, real, real uh, meaningful um, uh, tools for communities um, to better align these housing and land use policies. Um, there are um, a couple of provisions in the reconciliation bill uh, which is the bro more broadly talked about um, $3.5 trillion uh, Build Back Better Act um, that we are tracking. Um, one specifically uh, related to housing and transit is the Affordable Housing Access Program, a $9.9 billion grant program that would be jointly administered by U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, as well as the Department of Transportation. So sort of hearkening back to the Obama administration and a lot of the work that, that Maria was directly involved with, um, really enabling communities to receive funding um, to provide better transit access to affordable housing and siting of affordable housing near transit. And this really sort of intent gets to our third priority. And this is actually a signature uh, le legislative priority of Up for Growth Action, which is a bill that we call the Build More Housing Near Transit Act. And you know, money and capital resources is a critical element to driving more production around housing. But, but as we've seen with the discussion of exclusionary zoning uh, and these other artificial barriers to housing near transit, land use and zoning is a major impediment. And there is risk that to the extent more money, uh, whether it's through TIF, uh, RIF or TIFIA uh, or through other conventional sources are funneled into transit oriented uh, places, but corresponding land use policy changes are not implemented, uh, we'll simply see a rising of overall housing costs and a uh, more exclusionary outcome uh, for uh, affordable housing um, than, than otherwise. And so the Build More Housing Near Transit Act really encourages and provides transit agencies with a leverage point to work with their local government partners who control zoning, um, awarding bonus points uh, to uh, project sponsors for New Starts grants um, that obtain commitments of land use and zoning uh, policies uh, corresponding with housing needs along a corridor um, and perform housing feasibility assessments very similar to what Sound Transit uh, is already executing on as it uh, plans future um, uh, rail and fixed guideway transit alignments. Um, so we could talk about more about that in Q&A, but we think that's a very important bill. And then finally, um, last but not least, and this is a broader program uh, proposed by the White House. It's actually based on a bill that we worked on uh, with Senator Klobuchar and Portman uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, the Unlocking Possibilities Program. Um, uh, proposed as a $4.5 billion competitive grant program uh, that would be made available to communities that want to obtain uh, dedicated uh, policy design and implementation dollars uh, to tear down barriers to housing, to eliminate exclusionary zoning, to boost production of housing uh, while not increasing displacement. Uh, and these dollars are prioritized to the communities um, that are transit served. So while not transit funding directly, this goes hand in hand with the Build More Housing Near Transit Act and really provides planning and policy dollars, um, very similar to uh, the TOD planning grant pilot program uh, currently in existence under DOT, this would be a HUD program. Um, again, thematically, we're very encouraged that uh, there, there is more work uh, coordinating um, the activities and the policy expertise of DOT 
uh, with the activities and policy expertise at HUD. Uh, we are working actively on legislation that is moving um, to bring these two agencies together and at the local level um, to really create better coordination and provide resources for better housing and transit outcomes. Um, so that is uh, the current state of play here on the Hill. Uh, and I look forward to continuing this conversation and, um, and dialoguing with the audience and, and, and fellow panelists. Great, thanks, Mike. And I see we're getting lots of questions uh, coming in in the q and I would uh, invite any of uh, the panelists if there are things that you wanna type an answer to, because there's more coming in that we'll probably get a, a chance to talk about. But I really appreciate, um, I'm so blind, I have to put my glasses on here for a second. Uh, a question by Julia uh, Pasiuto, who's talking about, feels like we're talking about widgets here, units and density, when we should be talking about households and the people who are most impacted. And I think um, that is so important and right on. And I'm, I think it's a really great segue to hear from Khalil. Uh, I've had the pleasure to work with Khalil uh, Shalid and others at NRDC through the Strong, Prosperous and Resilient Communities Initiative that NRDC is helping to lead with enterprise community partners and the low income investment fund. And really that initiative is very much centered on community driven uh, equitable development. And one of the things that we've been pushing federally as well is to both make more federal resources available for community uh, based organizations to be resourced and co-design and be engaged in these projects and things like community ownership models and other strategies. Uh, but also really pushing on USDOT to provide greater clarity and guidance that MPOs and DOTs and transit agencies can use federal resources uh, and pass through some of those resources to help fund community uh, groups to be part of, of co-designing these processes. Khalil, I know you do a lot of work at the intersection of the environment and housing and racial equity and have been watching and following and engaging on the Justice 40 initiative very closely. So I'll turn it to you to, to share your perspective on the things you're really tracking and engaged and are hopeful about. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning and uh, afternoon. Um, well, I guess it's afternoon for everyone now. Um, <laughs> um, uh, as Maria said, my name is Khalil Shahid. I'm a senior policy advisor uh, uh, for equity in equity, environment, and just communities with the Healthy People Thriving Communities Program. That's a lot. Um, we say HPTC for short, uh, with the Natural Resources Defense Council um, based in our DC office, where I work uh, primarily on uh, federal policy, as Maria said, related to uh, climate, energy, affordable housing, and, and many other uh, uh, you know, complementing and connecting uh, aspects of, uh, of social policy and social equity uh, from an environmental lens. Um, and, 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 and so we've kind of come into this conversation, uh, you know, really uh, you know, from the uh, question of climate change and, 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 the, and the environmental ramifications of the way that we've built out our transportation infrastructure um, over, over the decades. Um, and, and for us, and, and it's really taken, um, you know, some learning because we really have to approach it from two different angles. And so uh, many of our um, environmental justice partners who work on issues around transportation are, are, are really keyed in um, and really interested in, in reducing uh, harmful pollutants and emissions from our transportation sector, be it through, be it through ports, be it through uh, heavy vehicles and traffic, or just through, um, you know, the concentration of, of high use uh, highways and, 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 and high capacity transportation corridors, you know, in and around communities of color and just being sort of, you know, bordered in, booked in, um, you know, by, by many different uh, high capacity transportation corridors. And so, you know, for them, you know, the question of equity uh, in the transportation space is, 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 is sometimes singularly about the issue of reducing vehicle emissions. Um, and that's both in the climate context, but also again in 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 the very local uh, household uh, uh, public health context. Um, but then we also work with you know many transportation advocates um, you know across the country um, you know around the issue of transportation and and definitions of equity to, equity that center more about, more about around mobility and access. Um, and so and so we kind of sit in the middle you know trying to bring you know many of these perspectives together. Um, and when we talk about transportation in the climate context, you know, as, 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 as our transportation sector 
is the highest source of carbon emissions of greenhouse gas emissions um, in our country. Um, you know, it, it, it's quickly, and I, I don't have to tell you all, um, you know, to see how quickly, you know, we understand you know, transportation is clearly intertwined with our, with our patterns of housing development. Um, and neighborhood development around the country, which really drive up uh, those uh, transportation emissions. And so, you know, we can't really solve uh, emissions uh, through the transportation question without also addressing uh, the question around affordable housing and those uh, development patterns uh, in, in our residential housing sector. And so that's, and that's where much of my work has come in, both um, through, uh, through, you know, the you know, uh, targeting um, emissions directly in the affordable housing sector. So trying to make our homes more energy efficient, um, you know, so that they consume less energy and, and, and contribute less to greenhouse gas emissions through that energy consumption, um, you know, but also, you know, beginning to, you know, rethink um, our land use and development patterns that really drive, you know, the type of sprawl of, um, of development that leave people, you know, with fewer, with fewer uh, transportation and mobility options much more car dependent, um, you know, but also put them um, at risk and in harm's way uh, over uh, much of our uh, uh, transportation infrastructure, our car center transportation infrastructure, um, you know, again, which, which overly burdens um, um, many uh, environmental justice communities. And so, you know, what, what we've been working on, um, you know, for the last, uh, what month are we in now? Uh, for the last 10 months, at least, um, you know, trying to, you know, work with uh, the, uh, with the um, administration, working with other partners and advocates, working with um, uh, uh, um, congressional offices uh, and staffers um, around the bipartisan inf infrastructure framework, which did include some of the transportation uh, reauthorization um, commitments that we wanted, but really didn't include uh, many of the environmental and climate initiatives related to transportation that we wanted to see. Um, so much of that was kicked into what we're now, uh, you know, hearing so much discussion about the reconciliation bill, which is not a bipartisan bill, as, as you all are, are keenly aware at this point. And so now the negotiation is just really trying to fight and to preserve as, as much um, of that reconciliation bill and the many um, um, you know, programs and initiatives that, that we want to see funded, you know, through that, through, through that bill that weren't in the uh, infra infrastructure package that will begin to better, um, uh, you know, coordinate our resources, both within DOT, but also working with HUD and other agencies, EPA, um, to provide a much more holistic um, approach to the way that we think about, uh, you know, these issues of climate change, transportation, um, and housing uh, much more uh, uh, consistently, holistically, um, and, and just in complement to each other. Um, and there are many, many issues, um, uh, you know, policies, um, you know, um, initiatives, one being uh, the um, Affordable Housing Access Program, which is a uh, $10 billion program, which is in the reconciliation bill, um, which uh, which is 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 targeting resources to build more to build and to preserve more affordable housing um, near uh, near uh, near uh, transportation stations um, and stops around the country, um, but. Again, you know, we're still having uh, this argument, uh, you know, with with many in the House as well as in the Senate, um, unfortunately, who still don't see housing um, as an element of our nation's infrastructure, um, which is why none of our none of the housing provisions that we, you know, had hoped to see uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure package were included um, because trans because because housing is as yet, um, you know, not considered transportation and I mean, not not considered infrastructure. And for many of you veterans of, of, of transportation, you know, from what I understand, th there was a time when, when, when transportation wasn't always seen as, as, as part of that conversation as well, particularly from the environmental angle. And so we had to fight to actually get transportation, uh, you know, it, it included in that. And, and so now we're, you know, sort of, you know, replaying that, replaying that history now uh, with, uh, with, with housing and, and trying to understand what role uh, infrastructure investment has in alleviating um, what is a national um, uh, affordable housing crisis where there isn't, um, you know, a district, uh, a zip code in, in the country where, you know, a, 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 a working class job can, uh, can, you know, really afford, uh, you know, the type of housing. Um, 
uh, or I, sh I should say there isn't enough affordable housing, uh, you know, to meet uh, the uh, demand um, across any of those districts. Um, but, you know, but, but programs like that, programs like the uh, Neighborhood Access uh, and Equity Grants Program, which is, um, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the kind of sexy aspect of that program is, is, is you know, tearing down many of those legacy highways that, that often split communities. Uh, I'm from uh, New Orleans, the seventh ward. And so, you know, so we talked, you know, uh, very passionately about the uh, I-10 corridor that came through Claiborne Avenue. Um, but there are other aspects of that program, which, which are just more about, you know, addressing issues around pollution, um, helping to, you know, improve and to, and to actually rethink, um, uh, you know, community relationship, uh, you know, to transportation, to road infrastructure, to transit, to maybe rethink roads from being these huge, massive, um, um, you know, four-lane highways to, 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 to thinking more about smaller, tighter spaces, walkable spaces, uh, you know, in, in, in many of these communities. And so there's many aspects, um, you know, to that, to, to that bill um, that could, you know, that could uh, immediately help communities, uh, you, know, uh, you know, beyond just thinking about, you know, tearing down highways, which, you know, I, I can just imagine that process in New Orleans, it would be a decades long process. And not something that, that that's going to be uh, of much service to communities uh, in uh, the short term, and that and 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 that piece in the reconciliation package is really sort of sort of a doubling down on what was included in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure package, the uh, reconnecting communities. Um, uh, program, which was just a $1 billion program, we were really hoping, you know, to get much more of that, which is in part why we doubled down again on it uh, in the in the reconciliation bill to get to get more resources uh, uh, devoted to that. I, I can't remember what the exact number was, but the administration wanted something upwards of around $130 billion uh, for that program uh, in uh, Biden's uh, original framework and it got cut down to a billion. Uh, and so now we're trying to add um, an additional four billion to it uh, through the reconciliation bill. Um, but but so um, but again, you know, we're in this space uh, where you know we have essentially one, one senator who is uh, who is uh, you know not moving off of his mark um, and attempting to uh, enforce drastic uh, uh, cuts. Um, into you know what many of us um, had um, envisioned uh, in this uh, reconciliation bill, um, you know. But one other element too that I think is 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 going to be really key um, and and important for this group um, is the uh, Lift Act, uh, which is the Local Infrastructure Funding and and Technical Assistance Act, which is also uh, a package that is a, a program that is included in the in the reconciliation bill, which includes a lot of funding um, for for pre-development grants and, te and technical assistance to communities, um, you know, because you know, with you know, you know, whether or not we get 3.5 trillion or we get 2.5 trillion or, or we have to go all the way down to 1.5 trillion, as Maria said, there are um, potentially a lot of resources on the line that are going to be coming into communities. Um, and but you know, how to ensure that 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 those dollars actually go to the communities that need it most. Um, you know, a lot of that is going to be determined by, you know, our ability to support community uh, uh, communities through technical assistance, through capacity building, uh, so, that, so that they can be prepared, so that they can um, ha have 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 shovel ready projects, you know, ready to go. Um, you know, otherwise those resources are, are going to come to, you know, the best resource, best resource, the best organized communities. Um, and, and those aren't always the ones uh, who need it. Um, and, 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 you know, the last piece I'll, I'll get into, and we'll talk about this, I think a little bit more in, in some of the facilitated conversation is sort of, is sort of the backdrop of framing all of this um, investment and, and all of this dialogue is the president's Justice 40 initiative. Um, which um, really is the culmination um, of really years of, of activism, of advocacy by the environmental justice community uh, really across this country, um, you know, to really uh, impress upon not only this, this administration, but policymakers, um, you know, across the country and at all levels of the legacy of uneven development, the legacy of environmental racism, um, and what the impact of that has been both on, on, on neighborhood development, on the way that we value different spaces, because, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, communities that are burdened, um, you know, with, uh, with, 
uh, with uh, toxic chemicals, uh, you know, with lower air quality are often deemed less valuable or often uh, disinvested uh, in economic development because of the presence of those harmful chemicals. Um, and, and so, and, and, and so, you know, it is the uh, it is the uh, integration of environmental justice with uh, community economic development um, uh, investments uh, through this uh, federal initiative, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, called Justice Forty, which uh, includes both provisions for affordable housing, but also for transportation. Um, and what we and what we and what we can think of this as, you know, particularly in the climate context, uh, is a way to 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 deliver a sort of pro poor investment uh, through our through our national climate initiatives, and so it's it's not enough to say that we are are investing in this green transition. We're we're uh, investing in the clean energy economy, but how do we do so in a way that benefits communities of color? That that benefits that benefits um, um, you know our legacy burden communities. At a rate higher than it does, uh, you know, the average population, so that we are, you know, using these public resources not only to, to make this transition, but to make this transition in a way that lifts up these struggling communities, lifts up these uh, these uh, these uh, these, uh, these uh, disinvested communities, and really targets resources uh, to the places that we need it most. Um, and, and I'll pause there so that we can uh, move on into uh, more of the discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Khalil. Thanks, all three of you. So. Lots of questions. We'll see kind of what we can get through here. Um, but there's a few along the, the theme. Um, so uh, Dr. Farajan, I'm gonna go back to you uh, and, and others can chime in here too. But, but we know that it's really hard to fund affordable housing, period. Um, it's particularly hard to do deep affordability in projects or long-term affordability projects. And I, I, I will say on the HUD side, uh, if folks haven't seen it, and, and I can share it in the chat, maybe on September 1st, the White House issued um, a whole bunch of things to try to make it easier for nonprofits and others to be engaged in affordable home ownership um, and, and, and uh, long-term affordability projects. But my question is, thinking about the financing side, so kind of looping from HUD back to DOT, sorry for the, the whiplash, um, is this a pipe dream? Is, is TIFIA and RIF, um, and, and I know we're using acronyms, so the uh, Railroad Reinvestment, Rehabilitation Investment Fund and the Transportation Innovative Financing Investment Act, uh, are, are TIFIA and RIF, is it crazy to even think about using those for long-term affordability projects or projects with significant affordable housing? Or are they just gentrification tools or or how should we be thinking about that? So I'd love to hear from you on that one. Sure, thank you for that question, Maria. And uh, yes, we use the acronyms because they're easier, quite honestly, sometimes they forget what, what, what they each stand for. But uh, let me tell you, for example, how RIF works. Under RIF, as I mentioned earlier, we can finance up to 75% of project costs. And that project cost includes not only the vertical development, but also horizontal development everything else that is needed for that development. One example that we have seen in different projects is, for example, an area that there is a, uh, uh, there is a, uh, a rail yard in downtown area that they can actually put a platform on top of that rail yard to create some space that then they can build on top of that. So it's basically now taking advantage of every space you have inside your city and that is costly. So the cost of that platform all the associated infrastructure related to that is also eligible, as well as the vertical development on top of the platform. And if you think about it, that if, if that can be financed with a loan at 2% compared to what a typical developer could get in market at 5 or 6%, the saving can be significant. We have figured out that right, back of a napkin type of calculation, of course, each project is different. That saving could save anywhere, uh, can, can be anywhere from 10% to maybe 20 or 30% of the project value. Um, so think about it. If you have a billion dollar project, all of this cost that I talked about, and they can finance it through RIF TOD instead of going to uh, a bank to get a loan, 10, 20% of that is about 100, 200 million dollars. So what happens to that saving? That's a really interesting question because for a private developer to be eligible to receive RIF TOD, they need to form a joint venture with a government sponsored passenger rail agency. And then as part of that joint venture, 
they negotiate between themselves how they want to spend that saving. And in many cases, we have seen that the, the, uh, the, the government sponsored agency may want to spend that on infrastructure improvements that they, want, they, they need to develop. In many cases, they may use that for affordable housing or anything else that they want to take advantage of. It could be in the form of a work that they will do for free. The developer is going to build for free based on that credit, based on that saving, or a check that they can simply write to the government sponsored agency that then they can go and invest it in, in some other improvements uh, that could be affordable housing. So that's one area that affordable housing can benefit from. The other area is, of course, they need to also comply with all local requirements. So to the extent that there are certain local requirements for affordable housing, they need to comply with all of that in order to get our loan, um, as well as federal requirements. So, 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 so that's the easy, simple answer I can give to you. We are also working very closely with HUD as well as the Department of Energy, because believe it or not, there are different programs within federal governments that in the past, unfortunately, we, have, we, we, we were not talking to each other as much as we should have talked to each other. But now, especially over the last year or so, I can tell you that there is a lot more discussion happening because there are different projects that maybe certain parts of it we can finance, but there are other parts that the Department of Energy can step in that they might have some programs that they can bring to table and finance it to make the overall cost of the project more affordable or even hot. Uh, and, and case by case is different, but projects that I'm seeing, affordable housing is usually a component of the discussion because uh, the developer, as I mentioned earlier, has to form that joint venture. They have to put something in place that can receive local support. It, can, it, it should also show us that uh, where those savings are being spent. And, and, and as you mentioned earlier, there are certain priorities that this administration has, and we always look at those priorities, you know, safety, resiliency, climate change, uh, 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 social justice. Uh, those are all the main factors that we look at it as we go through this process. They are not uh, criteria on the financial side, but they're definitely criteria for us, especially if we want to go above and beyond what we're doing in the past. For example, I can't announce this yet because it's a program, we're working on it, it's not finalized, but as some folks may know, under TIFIA program, even though legislation allows us to finance up to 49% of project costs, historically we have been at 33%. And now we are thinking about that unused capacity and thinking that, because when you, when you have a requirement, people usually meet the requirement. That's why it's called minimum requirements. But we are trying to see how we can use that as an incentive to push people to think about how they can go above and beyond just the minimum requirements, to take, to take the extra steps to make improvements to their projects, especially in those areas that I mentioned. Social justice, climate change, uh, resiliency, and safety. Great, thank you. That, that, was, that was a wonderful answer and, and has my mind going in lots of different directions, perhaps others too, thinking about opportunities there. And um, we have a bunch of questions related to kind of the highway connection, but I want to see just really quick, Khalil or Mike, anything you want to add to this, this concept around long-term affordability and really, you know, opportunities to address very low-income household needs that, that may be a nice layering with what we just heard? Yeah, I, I'll go really quickly. I, I was um, typing actually um, a response in the chat. Um, one, what, really quickly, I, I would say sometimes you know we use the term affordable housing, um, and you know that term can often blur um, what are important distinctions. Uh, you know, in the type of housing, um, oftentimes you know really to the detriment of say public housing, um, which 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 doesn't get you know the 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 types of, of, of advocacy and resources that you know, affordable housing generally does. Um, whereas you know, I, I would like to see us much more talking about um, you know, rethinking, resetting, reorganizing um, you know, the mix of housing type you know, in this country so that you know, community and publicly owned housing you know, you know, become a much larger share of our total housing stock. Um, you know, you know, and I think, you know, once we once we begin to talk about that mix of housing type, you know, we, we can better understand, um, you know, what are, you know, the different types and classes of housing that are going to be needed to really solve this crisis, because if we're just talking about affordable housing in the generic sense, and, and you know, we're just piling in subsidies on top of subsidies, um, and not really getting at um, and, and reaching uh, those uh, at the, you know, lowest uh, uh, rungs of the uh, income ladder. 
Thank you. And um, Mike, anything you want to add? Otherwise, we'll jump to our next question. Yeah, I mean, I would just add that, you know, we can't ignore the zoning conversation and the role that exclusionary zoning plays in limiting housing. I think to Khalil's point, you know, we want uh, a broader array of housing opportunities uh, because that is how to get to more affordability for more households up and down that income spectrum. And so I think that we need to, at the same time as driving more subsidy um, and long-term subsidy sources um, to provide income restricted affordable housing, we need to crack open that um, the, the, the zoning barriers uh, because not only does in many cases, exclusionary zoning uh, restrict the quantity of housing that can be uh, developed in high opportunity and transit served places, um, providing critical housing for people, um, but it also perpetuates inequities, meaning that you know the affordable or public housing opportunities for households, for families, for individuals, um, tends to be concentrated in low opportunity areas, uh, in non-transit served areas. So you know that remains our focus um, as much as increasing the funding pie. Great. Thanks. Um, and then a question, a few different questions have come in. I'm not, I'm not sure if any of us will really do a just answer on it, but um, you know, Seattle is not the only place in the country where transit is often being built um, in the highway median or near highways, uh, creating really significant challenges, not only to do transit oriented development, but to allow people in neighboring communities to access the transit. You know, it's, no one wants to walk across a huge dangerous highway or, you know, even if you've got a, a express ramp. So I, I'm curious in your um, policy work or as you're looking at the, the federal government and I just want to ex underscore the team that the Biden-Harris administration has assembled at DOT makes me really excited because we have a lot of people who've worked in community and understand this. So, do you see anything on, on the horizon beyond kind of the, the neighborhood reconnection program you already talked about, Khalil and Mike, to, to really kind of get at these issues and these challenges of, you know, can we think about federal funding or programs to help retrofit um, these kinds of neighborhoods that are near highways? And or how should we be thinking about transit going forward? Um, it's tough. We, we do that because Oftentimes the right of way is already in public domain and or it's cheaper to do that kind of uh, project, but then long-term it, it's not a great project. So any thoughts um, any of you have, or, or certainly Dr. Verjohn, you may have thoughts on it too, but I know NRDC uh, has been thinking about this too. So thoughts or reactions? Uh, well, I, I was just typing answer to one of the questions, but if I, if I heard your question right, um, I, uh, I, I, I think you were referring to the team that we have at USDOT now, and, and you're absolutely right. We have a very strong team. Uh, folks come from uh, different backgrounds, but, uh, but the good thing is that when they joined USDOT, they hit the ground running. And you can see that just over the past couple of months, how much has been done. It's just impressive. Uh, the TOD guidance that I mentioned earlier that we put out, it was just amazing how we went through that process and we were able to get all the uh, documents drafted, all the approvals in place and publish it in just about two months. Um, those who have been in federal government or, or any government, they, they know that, uh, it, it takes a lot longer than that typically, but, but that was a good example. Uh, the loans that we have been closing at Build America Bureau, I can share some statistics with you. Just over the past three months, we have closed $8 billion worth of loans, 15 different projects, 15 different loans for eight different borrowers. That is almost equivalent to what we typically close in four years. So to put it in the perspective that how active these programs have become just over the past couple of months, three months of the last fiscal year is equal to the previous four years uh, uh, of that. So. So I'm very optimistic. We have a very good pipeline. We have a very good team in place. Uh, they are looking at things very quickly. They are experienced. They know, they know what is important for them. And as I mentioned earlier, the level of coordination, even not within DOT, but with other agencies, it's, 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 it's very promising. It's, it's, it's just really good to see that we have this whole uh, government approach and uh, uh, folks are talking to each other. They're coordinating with each other. 
And we are incorporating a lot of these good transformative concepts into our programs. It's not just about financing anymore. It's just not about the, the technical side of the, of, of, of the projects. Uh, it is about the outcome that that project is going to deliver. And it's really good to see that shift from output driven approaches to outcome driven approaches. Great. And Khalil, do you want to have a last word on this and then we'll wrap up or? Yeah, I'll say, you know, one, one thing that we are, you know, really excited about, um, there is uh, a proposal in the reconciliation package for a community rest restoration and revitalization fund. It's $7.5 billion uh, a program, um, which, you know, also includes, uh, you know, a small amount, I think it's like $500 million, you know, specifically targeting uh, community land trust and other, um, you know, uh, cooperative and, uh, and uh, you know, community owned um, residential housing. Uh, but, and that's the floor, it's not the ceiling of what could go to, the, to those, you know, properties that you, you could access, you know, any, any amount of funding from that program for, for that, but this is a set aside, um, uh, you know, for that. Um, I think, I think overall, again, you, you know, um, the Justice 40 initiative, uh, what we are in the process of doing is working with the administration and with agencies um, as to pull together advocates from, you know, across all the major sectors of the Justice 40 initiative to really begin to come together and to talk about what implementation looks like. Um, you know, what are some of those creative ideas? Because, you know, you know, while we're talking about putting um, a lot of these resources uh, into, um, you know, various uh, programs, old and new, through the reconciliation package at, you know, whatever budget level we can get it to, um, there's still going to be a lot of work to be done, you know, to really think about, okay, how do we actually implement this stuff? How do we actually do the type of interagency partnerships um, and, and, and cross collaboration so that, so that, you know, funding sources, you know, can complement and support each other across various programs um, to make these things work. And this is just going to be the first phase of it, because I think, you know, we're still learning um, you know, as a country, how to really do these types of investments, um, you know, in a really uh, authentic and genuine way. You know, let's let's not let's not you know sugarcoat it that you know our country that we've had decades of really uh, from you know public policy through our public budgeting not really giving a full throated support uh, you know, and resources to addressing issues of poverty and inequality across our society. And so you know, this you know, is a very new opportunity. It's, it, it, and it's something that we're learning um, while doing as a nation to, to really do this type of work. Um, you know, and while we have you know, a lot of good resources, expertise and advocates on the ground, we need to get those folks you know, into some of these conversations, particularly here in DC with these folks on the Hill um, and, and in these agencies who are still trying to figure this stuff out. Um, so it's just a lot of work to do. Thank you. And uh, we are at time. So I want to thank you all for joining us. And just to, to echo, you know, we have a, a really significant opportunity to shape the future here. And uh, it's, it's one thing to say the right things. We all can do our work, as Khalil is saying, to reach out and have conversations to help educate our federal policymakers, whether they're in Congress or they're in the administrations to let them know what's working, what isn't working. The Seattle region is one of the regions that has been ahead of many others on issues of trying to link affordable housing and TOD, of innovative finance, of using racial equity uh, and health impactment uh, in assessment screens. So you have so much to teach and learn to hopefully reduce some of these barriers. So thank you for letting us join you and I'll turn it back to you, Ben. Great. Well, well, thank you, Maria, so much. And thank you to our esteemed friends at um, the Natural Resource Defense Council, the USDOT, and Up for Growth. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. There's clearly a lot moving right now um, in DC and elsewhere, and a lot of work ahead. Um, but it does underscore that, uh, as Maria mentioned, this is the, you know, the great challenge for our region and for many other regions around the country in terms of how do we develop more equitably? How do we make sure that these investments in our communities are serving community and addressing past harms? And um, it's exciting to see that there's the potential for so much more uh, federal policy attention and, and frankly, resources um, put to this really important and transformational work. So thank you all. We really appreciate, appreciate you and your time. And um, um, hope you have a wonderful um, Friday afternoon, but we're still in the morning here in, at, in, in, in Seattle, 
And so we're going to take a short break uh, before our second panel of the, the, the virtual program this morning kicks off at around 1035. So um, we'll give you all a, a time for a bio break and um, time to step away from the screens for a little bit. But please uh, stay logged on and join us for the second program, which will be focused on community-led TOD uh, with some great speakers and um, resources um, from our region. And um, again, thank you, Maria. And Dr. Frajian, um, Khalil, and, and Mike, uh, we really appreciate you. Thanks. Welcome back, everybody. We were just chatting amongst ourselves that we were we wished in the future we could have, play some fun music um, in interlude like this, but we'll we'll figure out the technology at some point. Um, welcome back to the second part of our virtual panel, uh, our second virtual pather, panel rather of our um, webinar this morning. Um, moving from that federal perspective and the, the the funding opportunities and the policy side. Um, more to the community-led um, development side. And so um, really thrilled to have a, a, a fantastic panel um, with us this morning. Um, I'll start by introducing the moderator of the panel and turn it over to him. Uh, so Rick Crochalis was the regional administrator of the Federal Transit Administration's um, office here in Seattle from May 2002 until he retired from federal service in June of 2016. So. He's um, well steeped in all things transit and really knows our region and its transit um, situation quite well. Um, not only to that, prior to joining the FTA, uh, Rick served as the director of design, construction, and land use for the city of Seattle for 10 years. So knows the development side very well as well. Um, and more recently, Rick ha has served as a member of Seattle's Design Commission from 2017 to March of 2021. Um, really happy to have him here with us today and you, you all will be in very capable hands um, as I turn it over to Rick. Thank you, Rick. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, we had really a fantastic panel to kick us off this morning, kind of that big picture of TOD, and it, it showed both the opportunities uh, that the federal government uh, and others are looking at and, and the complexity. Um, and, uh, you know, as I've sort of reviewed uh, TOD in, in my uh, time in various positions, uh, there are certain success factors that uh, we're going to talk about uh, and, and that the, our panel will talk about uh, later this morning. Um, some of those I've seen are, are clear commitment from local jurisdictions uh, for stationary planning and higher density rezones. We heard from Mike about the lower densities in many uh, around many stations and that can be reconciled. One good example uh, here locally, uh, City of Bellevue around their spring district, major up zone in that area with uh, density bonuses uh, for affordable housing. Uh, and as far as uh, local jurisdictions commitment, City of Linwood uh, has a dedicated staff for their center city development around their new TOD uh, stations. Uh, so that, that's another good example. Uh, community involvement, uh, the City of Seattle's equitable development initiative focusing equity is a good example of that. Uh, GAF financing, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, in a bit. The Roosevelt TOD for the newly opened station uh, there. Good example, if the city of Seattle had not come up with $15 million of financing, the, that project would not be able to be 100% affordable. So another good example. Uh, a supportive transit agency. San Transit has really stepped up their game in terms of a dedicated office for TOD and initiatives that they've done. Uh, so we'll, we'll again talk more about that. And finally, partnerships with both non profits and, and for-profit developers. Uh, I kind of represent, I'm co-chair of the Urban Land Institute's uh, Northwest uh, TOD Council. We've done over uh, probably about 10 uh, technical assistance panels over the last decade 
with local jurisdictions, bringing in developers and nonprofits to talk specifically. We just finished one up uh, for Everett about what are the opportunities for partnerships. Now, today's second panel uh, really brings together practitioners who are well versed in uh, community engagement, housing design, and affordable housing. Same format as the earlier panel, each speaker will first provide a short segment about opportunities for TOD from their perspective. Uh, then I'll moderate a dialogue with the panel members, and then we'll take questions from the Q&A box. Um, speakers today, uh, Patrice, it really got her start in community engagement in Southeast Seattle. Uh, we'll hear more from her. And she now works for the City of Seattle uh, as part of that equity development initiative team. Uh, Uche is the Director of Real Estate Development for Homesite one of our local nonprofits is very active in Southeast Seattle. Uh, one of the projects she's working on uh, is uh, Othello Square and some affordable homeownership opportunities there. And finally, Grace is an architect and co-founder of the principal of uh, Schemata Workshop, a Seattle-based uh, architectural firm who done a lot of equity work. Uh, Grace was involved in the Capitol Hill TOD, both as a community member and then did design work on two of the four buildings in the TOD campus. So we've really got uh, uh, a tremendous opportunity to hear from all. And I'm gonna start out with uh, Patrice. All right, um, so I did share um, a small bio um, to help bring um, myself into the space. So I'll just uh, read a little bit from it and then pass it on to Uche or Grace. Um, and so as Rick mentioned, um, I've, been, I've been blessed to build I'm a, my professional experience doing community organizing and advocacy in Southeast Seattle for almost 10 years now. I'm also um, a second generation resident of Seattle. Um, to honor this work, I wanna bring into this space uh, Southeast Seattle Organizing for Racial and Regional Equity, uh, the Race and Social Equity Task Force, the Equitable Development Initiative Advisory Board, Rainier Beach Economic Development Roundtable and Puget Sound Sage, and lastly, Rainier Beach Action Coalition. Um, there are many other um, uh, bodies of folks um, that I've had the pleasure to work with um, in the realm of TOD and other organizing efforts, uh, but just want to honor the work that um, has been going on and will continue to go on. Um, I also want to honor, um, for exemplars of this work, my grandfather, Frank White, White bringing him into this space with me today uh, for being a business owner over 25 years and serving his community unapologetically. My grandmother, um, who was a lifelong advocate for social justice and education in the workforce. My auntie, Frankie, for showing me the power of service. And my mother, Dr. Dr. Joycelyn Thomas, um, for modeling leadership through organizing um, and undoing racially driven health inequities. Um, so again, I'm a continuum um, of all of these persons that are both in my life and that I've have the, have had the privilege of working with. Um, I, as mentioned, currently now work for the city of Seattle in the Office of Planning and Community Development um, on the illustrious EDI team. Shout out to the EDI team, those of you are, that are here today. Um, we address displacement and un unequal dis distribution of opportunities to sustain diverse and diversity in Seattle. Um, EDI fosters community leadership of which um, I am a product and supports organizations to promote equitable access to housing jobs, education, parks, cultural space and expression, healthy food and other community needs and amenities. Um, so with that, I am checked in and I will pass it to Grace. Thank you, Patrice. Um, I'm gonna actually share, I, I wish that I had brought into my, into my intro with the um, my family and my forefathers, but um, I'm going to share my screen um, to show a few slides um, as my as my introduction, and you're going to have to bear with me if I transition to do that. Okay, um, there we go. All right. Um, so my name is Grace Kim. I'm an architect and co-founder of Skamata Workshop, where a Seattle-based architectural practice. Um, and uh, the way that we do our work um, is through this tagline. It's called, it's envisioning or empowering communities through architecture. And it's not just uh, a marketing tagline. This is how we conduct our practice. Um, and this very much informs our design approach. Um, our projects are pretty wide ranging public to private um, and span from large urban scale projects to small individual um, projects. Um, and 
community engagement and social equity are at the heart of what we do. So any project, regardless of scale, we try to engage users, engage the community um, in informing the, the resulting design and, and planning processes. So I'm here today to talk and share a little bit about my involvement. As Rick said, um, I was very involved with the Capitol Hill Equal Equitable Transit Oriented Development. Um, and this involvement spans over a decade um, and might talk a, bit, a little bit about that, but it started as work in the community as a community member. Um, during that time period, we were hired to uh, develop some guidelines for the neighborhood um, by the local chamber of, chamber of commerce. Um, and that kicked off uh, sort of the start of, of a decade worth of um, involving the community in um, and understanding what their um, desires were for the development that would happen at the heart of our neighborhood. Um, the resulting priorities were first and foremost affordable housing, um, also trying to incorporate affordable commercial space, uh, finding a permanent, permanent home for the farmer's market, um, incorporating uh, meeting space for the community, somehow incorporating arts and culture into the project, um, having sustainable design and very low parking ratios, um, and most importantly maybe um, having the highest quality of development um, for all of the buildings. Um, so the a resulting project uh, with four buildings and a plaza, 435 homes, 40% of which are affordable. Um, the overall project was about $156 million of total construction cost. There's almost 40,000 square feet of commercial space, 216 parking spaces for those 435 homes, and then 254 bike parking stalls. Um, and the projects all uh, achieved lead for homes platinum. Um, really quickly, the, the project area looks like this. There are four buildings. Samata Workshop was responsible for the design of the two at the bottom. Um, the projects look like this. Station House was designed for uh, community roots housing, a nonprofit developer in our neighborhood, 110 units of affordable housing. Um, and the park was, a, um, was market rate homes um, designed for Gurney Eland and um, their investor, uh, Bentel, Bentel Green Oak. Um, this project was 76 units in the same sort of volume as the other building, um, but included 15 affordable homes as well. Um, this project also incorporated many community values, as I mentioned before, but one that I didn't know earlier was the AIDS Memorial Project. Um, this was an overlay of an arts plan that was added to the project um, and that it resulted in four major pieces. Um, and that was a pretty important part of the project. This is what they look like in total, kind of completed, um, at least the two buildings that we were responsible for. Um, and I think this project, we're really proud of the way the project turned out. Um, there is a high level of quality for both the affordable and the, the upper end of the market rate. Um, it's a seamless uh, connection and, and integration of these types of um, homes uh, at serving different populations. And we think this is what um, successful e uh, equitable TOD looks like. It's leveraging our transit investment for the benefit of all. So with that introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to Uche. Stop sharing. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate on this panel. Um, I'll also share a few slides just to give um, uh, folks a little background about Homeside and what we're working on right now. So um, with Homeside, you know, we've been uh, serving Washington State and creating homeowners and building communities since 1990. Um, Homeside is a HUD certified counseling agency. We provide one of the most comprehensive home buyer counseling programs in Washington State. We're a CDFI, we provide affordable mortgage loan products, including down payment assistance loans that help families to buy and preserve their homes. And we are a place-based community development corporation. Um, as a CDC, our mission and programs have focused on community engagement and revitalization in Southeast Seattle, which is our community of focus. Um, and our community development initiatives have included facade improvement projects, establishing and growing business associations and convening community led coalitions to ensure that neighborhood vision and priorities are implemented as new development comes to our community. 
um, as part of the real estate development team, my responsibility has been to um, help revitalize neighborhoods by building sustainable, high quality homes that are affordable for first time home buyers. Um, since 1991, we've developed a range of housing from single family units to townhomes, condominiums, and now we are working on a limited equity cooperative that is 100% affordable to uh, families earning 80% of the area median income. Um, adding affordable housing stock not only st strengthens the economic base and stabilizes the community, it helps in mitigating the negative effects of gentrification. Um, um, even before I had started Homesite, it started to expand its work more broadly with community-based organizations, concentrating efforts to increase the level of livability in the Rainier Valley, which is part of our, um, our community of focus, Southeast Seattle. And so when light rail came to the valley, we helped to build the capacity of resident pro uh, groups to address the displacement of small businesses, community safety concerns, and physical infrastructure concerns. And our method was to help foster economic development through business organizing along the Martin Luther King corridor, with the, which, is where, which is where the light rail primarily runs in Southeast Seattle. And the goal was to increase the capacity and voices of businesses and ultimately you know, build an economically sustainable and culturally diverse business district, organizing residents in the area to further support the growth of that district and also foster leadership development among residents and business owners. And this is just a, a small list of some of the activities that we do. Um, so as far as our current uh, development activities, um, you know, uh, the issue of displacement brings into greater focus what is being faced by our community every day, especially with the increasing development pressures and decreasing affordability of existing folks to stay in the neighborhood they helped to create. And so this was what was behind the vision of the Othello Square project, which we're working on in the Othello neighborhood in Southeast Seattle, you know, to address, to address these displacement issues in a holistic manner that benefits the community, you know, creating access to opportunity you know, childcare, uh, community health services, social services, education, job training, all of those things so that, you know, people can compete for jobs that pay a living wage and, and um, also provide uh, development skills for small businesses, etc. So this is a, a sort of a picture of uh, the campus and we've been working on this since 2016, not quite as long as as Grace has been working on her projects, but it feels like a long time. <laughs> and um, we look at this as an opportunity for the community to preserve and support, you know, its cultural diversity and its neighborhood character. Southeast Seattle is one of the most diverse neighborhoods. Um, and Othello neighborhood in particular, which is in the heart of Southeast Seattle, is identified by the city as a neighborhood with the highest risk of displacement and the least access to opportunity you know, equitable health uh, services, education, and the community played a huge role in planning and designing the program components of this uh, campus. So these are some of the, these are pictures of those buildings. Um, in the uh, upper left corner is the Opportunity Center. Um, this is the charter school, the elementary charter school, which is now open. Um, and then, uh, this building in the, the middle right uh, left side is the Orendo Apartments and it has Odessa Brown Children's Clinic, their newest um, uh, location, as well as a Tiny Tots, which is um, um, infant to pre-K, um, early childhood learning and development. So we feel like, you know, opportunity, this is an opportunity to impact the well-being and prosperity of our community, and it still exists. You know, neighborhood planning efforts have identified community vision and priorities, and they've been adopted, adopted by the city. Um, investments from public and private sources are helping to move planning efforts to implementation, um, as Rick mentioned, and major corporations rooted in Seattle are stepping up to the role of investing in community-driven solutions. Closing disparity in access to opportunity externally has been home sites historic focus through homeownership, you know, creating financial equity. But that focus has expanded as we better understand that closing and if not entirely eliminating disparity um, 
<clears throat> excuse me, it starts, you know, anytime we take action, resourcing and helping to build capacity of others to go after those resources for themselves, to decrease in unequitable experiences, eliminate barriers that have prevented the full participation of those groups that have been traditionally left out of the conversation, especially the conversations and interactions that help them to be positioned to be more you know, self-determinant and as a result, prosper and reach their full potential. The time for, um, the time for groups working in silos and competing with each other is, is gone. And so this is a, you know, a community led TOD um, is a different way of working. It means slowing down to make sure that we are getting all input and in making decisions. Um, and in order to achieve increased community impact, we, we need to shift the way that we've been working, you know, greater emphasis on community organizing um, is helping the, the coalition, helping them achieve a greater community impact, you know, more perspectives are at the table. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rick. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you all for the good uh, start. I want to address the first question to Patrice, uh, and it's been touched upon a bit by, by Grace and Uche. What are, from your perspective, what are the essential ingredients for doing meaningful community-led uh, focused TOD? What needs to be balanced or focused on, and what's been missing, and how do we, how do we uh, turn the corner on that? Yeah, I, I have to uh, nod to Uche in her last line around um, time, right? I think often when we walk into a process, um, those of us that may be, or I'll say historically from community perspective, um, folks that are walking into the process and, and looking to engage community come into a situation with a preconceived or an ideal timeline. And um, throughout this work, I think all of us here on the panel have learned that that timeline needs to be nimble. And often that timeline, um, if not always, needs to be set by a community um, because we know communities work um, is ever um, ebbing and flowing, right? And so um, when it comes to TOD, this is just ends up being one pillar of a larger body of work um, for a community that, that folks, um, expect um, them to be involved in and of course give input outputs. Um, but if I had to uh, rattle off a list, I would say again, deep organizing and, and early infrastructure planning. Um, there is something to be said when it comes to harm done rather than uh, um, good that um, could be done. Um, when you come into a planning process and there is no infrastructure to receive that planning process. And by that, I mean, I mean, um, capacity building, but more specifically, the workforce that is needed to actually execute it. Um, I will every now and then throw a workforce into the mix when it comes to TOD. Um, blame that on my, uh, on, on my, uh, my old boss at SEED, actually. Um, I had the opportunity back a couple of years ago to work beside Uche, literally and figuratively, um, under Lance Madsen. And so uh, workforce is, you know, I think at the root of everything, and when it comes to community organizations and the folks that are so integral to this work, it is impossible to expect um, them to lean into this work and lead this work in the way that is desired and in the way that they desire without having to have, without having that, um, that, uh, the, the preemptive work done. So making sure that they as an organization are buttressed appropriately, whether that is budgeting, whether that is um, training, whether that is building up their people power, whether that is um, uh, leaning into whatever organizing and advocacy efforts they have going on regarding their own neighborhood planning and making sure that that is robust enough. Um, um, so that's, that's number one for me. I'd also say again, recognition of uh, previous planning. Um, we know that community again is um, always in how do we make sure that we are able to thrive? How do we make sure that we are able to be preemptive? How do we make sure that we can keep our, our families, our businesses, our cultural spaces, um, our practices, um, jobs in place? And so being able to honor the work that is done prior to coming into a planning process um, is equally as important. Um, knowing that long-term engagement 
um, is to be expected. So it's not just about, okay, we're going to have a 12 month or a five year planning process, but beyond that, what are our commitments both, um, you know, as city apartments um, and up and what are our commitments to each other, right? Like, what does it look like for us to embed this in um, reciprocal work planning efforts? What does it mean to embed this in budgetary process going forward to make sure that it is not just a plan for plan's sake, to make sure that priorities are met and priorities are resourced. Um, because I think also we've seen um, through all the, the projects that have been listed here before you um, uh, that, you know, we can, we can have an idealized and a fully vetted by community process. But then if we have to spend another 10 years advocating for the resources to bring it to light, um, what is the value that's lost there? What's the impact that's lost there? Um, I would also say um, ownership models, and that's really where EDI um, it plays a really clutch role. Um, we uh, do our best to make sure that in, in I'd say, I don't wanna say any planning efforts, but specific to TOD, um, that there is opportunity for community to come in and not just only lead it and guide it, uh, but to at the end of uh, at the end of it all have some ownership stake in it. And to Uche's point and to Grace's point, there are various models that can be taken. Um, one model is not going to work for every community, is not going to work for every priority or business type. Uh, but the end game is ownership and stake in what's happening there. Um, so that's that's. That's my initial response to um, what is meaningful TOD um, and what's missing, you know, um, the big, the bigger picture, right? Um, we know, I, I want to say, I was talking to actually Uba about this a couple of days ago. My first introduction to TOD was through a training with Puget Sound Sage, right? And um, that training allowed us to see, you know, okay, what's the intent of this? This is before, like, equitable TOD was a thing, right? So what's the traditional intent of TOD and, and all of its many um, buckets and, and, and focus? Um, but what do we actually want it to be, right? And that that what we want it to be is going to vary across the board. Um, and so I think a, a larger approach to this, an overarching approach, um, and knowing that every single um, um, site-specific approach is going to be different, but ideally it feeds into the North Star around um, thriving communities um, and equitable, equitable access. So that's my, my first response to it. Thank you. Yeah, Peter Sound Sage has done some really good work in the community, including around Grand uh, Street Station. Yep. Uh, and uh, leads us to the next question. Uh, once you have that community engagement and that vision, uh, what challenges to actually pulling off equitable TOD? Um, and what, what has worked and what are some common themes we have successes. So uh, Grace, you, you had uh, a good lead in on this. Uh, please start us out. Okay. Um, so I think that um, the biggest challenge is like business as usual, right? So I think about um, a project that I'm working on right now um, and working with a small community-based organization that represents um, uh, the intellectual and developmental disability community. And as we're talking with different developers and talking with different agencies, um, it's there, we're often met with, well, we can't do this because you know, affordable housing is funded this way. So you, know, you have to target this population and you can't do it with this, for this reason. So there's all of these you know, people raising uh, flags saying, nope, can't do it, can't do it. And I think that's the biggest challenge is that we've become so siloed in the way that we fund our projects that we can only think about affordable housing if this whole building in its entirety is affordable to a certain population. And that might not serve the whole community. That, is, that makes a lot of assumptions about who the community is, that, that all BIPOC individuals are low income or that all low income individuals are BIPOC. Like that's not true, right? And so how do we, how do we serve um, or, or how do we create communities that are whole and inclusive of all of the population that wants to be there? I think that's where the, when we think about TOD, the equitable part is how do we engage and include all people of all abilities? And it's not just set aside like small, you know, 5%, 10% of units being set aside for folks. Um, it's that every, it's designed in a way that everybody can be included. 
Um, and, and then that's when you start looking at incomes um, to see who's qualified for which types of units. Um, so I think that's a, a big um, challenge of, you know, as we're trying to create uh, communities that are more complete and inclusive, um, how, do we, how do we knock down some of the silos or figure out how to bridge across the silos? Maybe that's another way because those silos probably aren't going away in my lifetime. Yeah. Uche, any follow up on that? Uh... I think I think that Grace is right on about that. Definitely, you know, trying to figure out how do you you bring as many different voices, regardless of you know the labels that uh, outside you know organizations, municipalities, et cetera, want to put on them in terms of whether they quote unquote qualify to live or op operate a business in that particular neighborhood. I think it's really important to have as many voices as possible at the table because they they should be part of the decision-making and then have them feel listened to um, and, you know, and valued. And I would also say, you know, something that Patrice said about having enough resources, you know, having, that's also a challenge, you know, figuring out how to combine all of those resources. I'm working on a project now that has four different sources. And sometimes that can create a challenge to you know, a conventional lender. There's so many people, you know, in line to, you know, have, um, you know, uh, a stake in the yeah. success of the project. So I don't know if I want to be involved and that can be a challenge. Just trying to make sure that your program stays intact and that you have all of the, the financing, which is always shrinking as part of that project. And then of course, you know, the overarching mitigation of displacement and gentrification that's accelerating. That's, that's also a big, big challenge. Trish, any other thoughts on this uh, in terms of uh, equitable TOD? You, you've got that EDI initiative that you've been working on. Yeah, it's, um, Grace and Uche are making me think about the conversation that I believe we all are having to some degree about how are we defining public benefit and how are we defining um, success from project to project? And it is a prickly one and I won't get too deep into it because you know, um, to, to a certain degree you have to you know, uh, give homage to all of our folks that walk the legal ease, but that's something that we really struggle with, you know, um, layered on um, like that, in spe like specifically to um, funding mechanisms and in, in, tra in traditional access to funding mechanisms, right? So we're not only trying to figure out how do we um, support our project sponsors as leverage, right? When it comes to accessing traditional funding mechanisms, um, but it's also like, how are we changing that narrative and impacting the narrative of you know, you know what what may be what what may be of value to me may not be of value to you. To Uche's point, um, and coming to like some common some common language around that, right? Um, it's it's not all about the yield, right? It's it's about the impact. It's about the person. So how do we how are we bringing it down to the granular granular level and allowing it to be represented in actual projects? Um, and over time, seeing it also represented in actual health of communities um, and those those families and again those businesses and, and anchor institutions that are able to stay um, over time. Thanks. Um, Next question, how can developers and local jurisdictions better engage with each other and with the community and, and especially those underrepresented communities that we've been talking about in the TOD process and what, what has been successful? I know you've all had some examples of that. So who, who would like to jump in first? I'll jump in. Um, I think what's really important is to be as transparent as possible to the community that you're trying to engage with, you know, communicate what your plans are um, from the very get go so that you can, you know, sort of begin to build a little bit of trust behind, you know, uh, behind uh, their feeling that you actually as a developer are interested in what the community wants and needs and wants to be able to, you know, provide as much as possible to them. You know, um, that means, you know, working with, as she was saying, you know, on the ground community grassroots organizations and neighborhood groups, you know, to reach those who may not have been, who are, who are typically not, 
you know, at the table, but whose opinions are just as valuable. Um, I think that that's important as well. I'll add to that um, by saying, um, I think it's important to build relationships early, not just when you need those um, engagement activities to happen. So there's a, there's a tendency, I think, in, in, in our planning culture here and, and across the country, um, that when there's a project and there's community engagement required, that it happens just in that moment. And it's important to build those relationships early and, and to go back to the community repeatedly, um, you know, asking, asking for input and then showing them how it's incorporated builds trust. And that trust doesn't happen over one or two workshops or open houses. It needs to happen over time. It needs to be engaging um, the community members and really hearing from them, not just like, oh, here's three options, tell us which ones you like, but like, what are the community issues that really need to be embedded in? And they might not always feel like architecture or urban design related things. They might be programs or they might be ways to engage um, folks in the neighborhood to produce this comment, it comes to workforce development. Like, you know, are there ways for local businesses, local people to be involved in the construction of or in different services um, or to be trained um, in apprenticeship programs? Um, I also think like having, thinking about um, accommodation, um, whether it's translation, whether it's um, physical access, um, oftentimes our messages to the community is, you know, we're having this event and contact us and let us know if you need accommodation of any sort. Well, that doesn't make it super um, friendly. <laughs> and also it doesn't allow for a spontaneous, like I, I can't actually make it. Um, and then all of a sudden realizing, oh wait, I, my evening is free and now I can go. Um, so, you know, in the marketing of it, is it, is it possible or in the planning of, of events to make it possible for people to see, you know, in the pictures that are going out, that there are people that look like me, whether I'm whether they're in a wheelchair or whether they are a person of color, whether they're you know older or younger, like so that it's obvious that there's room for for someone that looks like me, um, and then don't make the assumption that they're that people will contact you. Just say ASL translation is is, is provided. We are going to be translating in these languages, and let us know if you need some other language. Um, but to put that out there forward so that it's not a uh, um, a hindrance for people to uh, participate. Um, and then I think letting youth know um, and engaging them because oftentimes the youth are the translators for their families. So, you know, rather than going to the conventional places where we post, um, you know, information about community meetings or, or um, you know, upcoming engagement for a TOD project, take it to where the kids are um, and, you know, and encourage the design teams or San Transit or whoever to go into the schools and give the kids a view into what potential pipeline for, for you know, career opportunities, but also a chance to have a say in their community and to, for them to drag their parents to the community meeting and tell them why, you know, and have the kids explain to their parents why it's important that they show up. I wanted to bring in uh, those who are familiar with the Roosevelt neighborhood and I pick up on uh, what you've been said about not just uh, talking to the neighborhood in the immediate uh, situation of trying to find a TOD partner, that neighborhood has been active in developing their own neighborhood plan. And they work with the city of Seattle uh, for an up zone uh, that would uh, accommodate increased density, uh, very positive. And then when Sound Transit said, okay, we're, we wanna do TOD on uh, uh, right adjacent to the station, uh, they again uh, involve the community and interesting enough enterprise gave a, a grant to the uh, Roosevelt uh, community to actually study what types of TOD they'd like and uh, got some special consultants to look at uh, cost factors and the neighbors said you know we'd like it to be 100% affordable yeah. Um, and it was, okay, well, how, how, do, how do we do this? And Sound yeah. Transit continued to work with them. Uh, they put out an RFP. Um, they had a community member involved in reviewing responses to the RFP, Sound Transit did. So that, that's a real shout out for them to do that. And then when um, the partnership uh, came forward, uh, two nonprofit developers, City of Seattle, and I, I mentioned that earlier, they were able to come up with a $15 million uh, grant 
to really bridge that, that financing gap to make it 100% affordable. Because in many cases, you got to do a mix, as Grace talked about, uh, for-profit and uh, uh, affordable. And, and that can work also. But in this case, 100% affordable. So that was a good example of a long-term community engagement, Sound Transit working, a third-party enterprise, giving the community some resources to hire some experts, uh, full engagement, what, what they wanted, and then the, the request for proposal uh, coming up with two nonprofit helpers, both of which needed each other to, because they, it was a little bigger scale than they're used to doing. Uh, so they developed that partnership and, and it really uh, worked out well. Um, I wanted to uh, touch upon uh, uh, anti-displacement efforts. Uh, you've all sort of talked around that. Uh, Patrice, what, what can you share with us in terms of what you've seen in terms of how we can overcome that displacement? Yeah, um, Grace said, this, you know, we, we may not see the fruits of this within our lifetime, right? Um, I do want to touch, though, Rick, really quickly. Um, you mentioned neighborhood plans, action plans, and, and I, I want to elevate, I'd like to elevate an example of uh, deep engagement uh, when it comes to um, the bigger picture of development, right? So we have TOD, but we also have beyond how, what, whatever that, you know, the site specific um, definition. And so um, the neighborhood of Rainier Beach, um, not even wanna put a specific year on it, um, had engaged uh, the city um, in the neighborhood planning process, developed an action plan, um, has four pillars, um, and approached the city's planning department um, to really have a deep conversation about, okay, we know we're going to have growth here. We know what kind of growth we would like to see as a community, as a neighborhood. We know what our priorities are. How can we influence and incentivize developers to meet our needs that we've specified through this plant neighborhood planning process um, through the zoning process, right? And so they were able to go through a really deep process uh, with the planning department and figure out um, what were key elements that could actually be incentivized for height preferences, um, uh, you name it, and came out on the other end with Rainier Beach zoning, right? And so this is now a tool that they have to engage different developers that either they bring in themselves for projects. I believe right now there are about 17 sites that are um, intended to be developed developed in the neighbor in the Rainier Beach neighborhood, but there is like tangible working shared language, right? So even if they themselves beyond the one project um, that that Rainier Beach neighborhood Rainier Beach Action Coalition um, is is stewarding, even if they are not um, to the point of every community organization is not going to be a developer or want to walk alongside a development process, if they're not able to do it themselves, they have um, tangible working guidelines um, for folks or for developers, not for profit or not, um, that intend to do work in the neighborhood. And so I think those are really two prime examples of what success could look like um, for a neighborhood. When it comes to anti-displacement work, it is every prong you can think of. Um, it is housing, it is tackling housing, it is tackling education, it is tackling workforce, it is tackling open space, it is tackling community ownership, it is tackling um, the notion of you know, I'm displaced if my church is displaced, right? So even though I may still maintain residency here in this neighborhood, if the places where I worship and play and educate myself are no, are no longer here, then I am essentially displaced. And so um, it's, it's going to take a, a holistic effort, I think, as a program um, we are focused on the community spaces. We are focused on how are we building, um, you know, um, um, prowess when it comes to staying power in that way, but also what does wealth building look like, right? That, that's also a definition that varies from neighborhood to neighborhood, community to community. Wealth building for one community could be, we need to have, you know, a, a, um, uh, it could be home ownership, it could be commercial space ownership, it could be growth in your small to mid-sized business for um, black and brown communities. Um, in other communities, it could be um, demarcated by the number of savings accounts opened up in your local credit union. And so um, as a program though, the EDI is um, truly focusing on um, community ownership of space 
and trying to mull over what those various models are and making sure that as a funding program, um, we are not contributing as much as possible to being a barrier. Um, so making sure that our funding mechanism remains as nimble and, and responsive to the need. We, um, you know, coming out of this year, I think have the biggest um, and fullest picture that we have um, had in a really long time um, regarding the need, um, regarding the, the hill that we have to climb in, in this real estate market, um, regarding the, the not only cross de departmental, but cross sector partnerships and onboarding that we need to do when it comes to holistic and uh, uh, um, granting, giving, um, resourcing, however you want to define it. Um, but we need to grow the pot. And so um, going into 2022 and beyond, um, we really do feel like the, the approach that we have been taking is the best approach, but we've got to grow the pot. And so um, that's that's our, that's our call to action today. Okay, anything else on displacement would you like to contribute? Well, just to sort of lean into what Patrice said, you know, about when you think about holistic, it's not just the particular elements and then you put them all together in the pot. You need to, you know, be aware of the context in which you're developing these things, you know, um, looking at the community, not as, uh, as you know, one one building will make everything magically occur, but to to see it, you know, as um, um, an eco ecosystem where each element affects others, and and you need to consider what that community needs, which is why it's so important to listen to what it is that they do need. And I, I want to take my hat off to you know the city; they're really also leaning in. I'm part of. Um, a wealth building cohort with that is that was started by the city to figure out different kinds of ways that we can you know assist communities in figuring out how to build wealth whether it's through you know trusts or cooperatives both commercial and residential you know is it capacity um, of course it's always financing but there are other are there other tools that can help them you know be the steward of their own you know progress I think it's probably time Patrice, to pivot to some could, questions. Go ahead, Patrice. Yeah, I, or Grace. Actually, if I could just jump in and just add one thing. I think that um, in, in terms of anti-displacement, it, it's important um, to identify the populations that are gonna be displaced early. And, and to Patrice's point, start that planning process early because once the station goes in and you're trying to figure out, respond to an RFP process, it's too late. Right, like that displacement, but that displacement train is on its way. So understanding, like we know now, the things that the Sand Transit is planning to build in the next decade. So looking at those station areas and thinking about who are the populations that are there now and that, and that are at the highest risk of displacement, the planning process needs to start now for those groups to get, or they, they might not know how to get organized, right? They might not be involved with planning or understand anything of this process. So how do you get them organized in a way that they can in, inform the things that are happening and that the, the zoning and the, um, the, the property acquisition, the things that need to happen so that they can stay, that community can stay, not just the, the affordable rental units, but to Patrice's point, the places where people worship, the places where people you know, buy their culturally appropriate groceries and things like that, those, those in, cultural institutions need to stay in, in order for the displacement to not occur. So the displacement will happen if we do not plan ahead. And, and we all know now where those sites are gonna be. So this is when we should start planning. Yeah. Good point. I think we should pivot to some of the um, questions coming in uh, from the attendees. And one, just continue on what you just said, uh, Grace and Patrice. One question asked about preservation of small businesses um, and how they might be engaged uh, in that survival in this um, you know, marketplace. Uh, any, any thoughts on that, that specifically? Yeah, um, I, I do wanna, I would like to circle up, you know, many of our communities are already displaced. And so um, there, is, there is also that reality, right? And so how are we also considering in the work um, 
you know, opportunities and, and mechanisms and pathways for folks to return. Um, and for, and I, I'm there, we, we have a, an equitable development initiative advisory board, shout out to the EDI advisory board. Um, and I'm thinking about one of our board members, uh, Ms. Cote, and um, she does her best to remind us you know, that communities oftentimes do not need to be built. They need to be like reestablished or rebuilt. If you're out there in the ether, Cote, please correct me. Um, send me the right language. Um, and so there's like that acknowledgement of that this displacement has already happened. And so how are we helping to like repair that harm? Um, and I'll make a plug for our, our equitable development initiative, our equi EDI monitoring program. And so this is also, a, this is a monitoring program that was developed by um, our wonderful interim advisory board that is now um, um, permanent. And, 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 and that monitoring program is to your point, Grace, um, really is about um, how are we, um, uh, what, what measurements are, are that we are aware of right now are we able to grab and track over time? Um, but also just knowing that we know data is, is ever evolving. And so what are we continually, or and how are we continue to continually updating um, this tool so that we can be preempt preemptive, right? We know now from the historic data and from the present time data where the immediate need is. Um, but again, we know people flux, policy fluxes um, and all of that. And so we want to make sure that we always remain true um, to where that, um, to your point again, Grace, that 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 high um, risk of displacement, low access opportunity where those areas are um, so that we can make sure that we remain true to our North Star. Um, and I'm so sorry, I just got turned around from the question. What was the, uh, oh, small business. Um, I have to uh, take my hat off to the Office of Economic Development. Um, and also say, um, you know, they uh, coming into this coming into this realm, uh, they were one of my first contracts working um, with Seed through Seed, um, uh, doing small business district or business district revitalization work um, through their only in Seattle program, and that program um, has I won't say they have taken a turn, but they that program has been hyper responsive. And as of late, they have been focusing on legacy businesses, right? And so again, it's that recognition of, um, we know what the need is. We know what this neighborhood wants to see as far as their business mix is concerned and how they have defined it. But we also know there has been loss and so I think there, there is that balance between um, how do we meet the ask here and now and how do we repair that harm? Um, and so that partnership with, and also knowing that not every business district is going to be, um, is going to desire um, being a, um, uh, what is it called? Um, it's, it's lost on me at the moment, um, but not every business district is going to have the, the, the tax base to be like a traditional, you know, um, self um, regenerative, um, self-serving entity, right? And so the, 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 um, the, the track that OED has taken to really come in and partner deeply with these neighborhood business district uh, districts, I've seen to be really successful when it's come to executing plans for not only creating spaces and working to create um, affordable commercial spaces for local neighborhood businesses, but also pathways for those that have been displaced to return. And for growth that are, for, for businesses that don't aren't in Seattle, because um, there's lots of TOD sites outside of Seattle, I think those small businesses need to start reaching out to their other fellow small businesses. Like, organize yourselves and advocate for yourselves. If there's not a chamber of commerce, if there's not um, some sort of organizing group, make one for yourselves. Um, because as an, an individual business that might be small, that might seem daunting and like, how do you even approach that process? And your voice might be small, but if you have a coalition of 20 or 30 business owners, um, and you go to the city or you go to Sound Transit, then you have voice um, and you can advocate for, you know, inclusion of small um, affordable uh, retail spaces in a TOD development. You can advocate for things when you have collective voice and power. So I would encourage you to reach out to other folks and don't sit 
in a silo or by yourself? One really good question here. Um, said the panel members have mentioned community ownership. Can you elaborate on the difference between affordable development and community ownership? And I know for sure we've had, uh, we've mentioned SEED, that there's also uh, Capitol Hill has a, a public development authority. It's really that public development authority versus uh, the separate ownership model that Uche talked about. So if, if the panel could uh, could address that to uh, that, that definition between community ownership and uh, affordable housing, which can be two sides of the same coin or separate. Um, I think they're both two sides of the same coin and separate. Um, you know, uh, community ownership cooperatives, for instance, you know, um, that's both community ownership and affordable. And that, and so, or you could have, as you were saying, you know, um, PDAs that that develop affordable housing and and then give the opportunity for the spaces within that structure to to be owned either collectively or individually by you know community members. And so it really depends on perhaps the vision of whoever is uh, deciding to develop that. Also, um, looking at how the community wants that development to happen in their space as well. And so those are the those are some of the things that you have to balance, you know, and really, but making sure that your focus is really on what the community is saying they need and what not what you think is needed or how you have been doing your business, you know, in the past. Yeah, and I think that to think about community ownership or affordable housing in our country tends to be looking at just like the rental income ranges, right? Um, and there's very, I mean, there's some money in the city of Seattle for affordable housing or ownership, and there's some money at the state level from commerce for affordable ownership, but that pot is very small. Um, and, and I think it's important to be thinking about, you know, ownership can look like the community, um, you know, owning land in a community land trust. Um, it could look like, um, ownership of commercial spaces so that there's, um, um, you know, the, the relevant and culturally appropriate businesses, but it could also be the pipeline. So, and this is kind of addresses another question that was in the chat or um, about pipeline. Like it can't just be that we're targeting one population. Affordable housing does not stay and, and our incomes are not, well, hopefully our incomes are not a static situation. So you need to, we need to be looking at the whole spectrum of housing opportunity and so there need, if, if we don't have that, that relief valve of affordable home ownership as the pipeline for folks that are kind of nearing the top of their income range and, and their, their qualification for rental housing, there needs to be a relief valve so that they're not sitting, taking up space when they could be on a, on a route to home ownership. That helps the whole sort of housing pipeline move. But the way that we focus just on rental housing is, I mean, I'll be honest to say it's it's a form of oppression it's 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 a continual of continuum of our federal government oppressing um lower income people and sometimes people of color by keeping those rents in a certain income range and not giving them a place to go in terms of ownership so back to that community ownership clearly a public development authority can own or lease land so we have chinatown um, id as a public development authority uh, Seed, uh, Capitol Hill has public development authority. In that instances, they can acquire land. And there's a new cultural space public development authority. The city of Seattle has just recently um, enacted. So that particular PDA is looking at cultural space in the community that they can own, lease, acquire land to do. So those are the kind of issues of community ownership uh, that are potential. You, you could arguably create another public development authority focused on equitable TOD. Uh, I know the city has, has looked at that. That would be an opportunity as well. So there, there are a variety of, and then the, of course uh, in, in San Trance's case, and I'm gonna to pivot to a question that John Morgan asked. He said, and, and you'll probably through with this uh, race. When, uh, the question was when San Trance met with Capital Neighborhood starting in 2009 about TOD, they repeatedly told us they were prohibited by federal law from including any affordable housing on land they sold off. They categorically rejected the whole possibility. How did that change the point where Sound Transit had champions of everything and try to block? I'll, I'll try to answer a bit about that. And, and Grace, you can add on since you were involved with that for 10 years. 
Um, the federal government never uh, uh, had that prohibition. I'm not sure where they got that from. Uh, I think what happened was San Transit initially, before uh, San Transit 3 was passed and some state legislation, their mo business model was to sell off those, those remnant parcels and uh, those uh, construction staging areas and make a money and return that back to build more transit. That was their model. Then the state um, changed the law and said, no, when you have surplus property sound transit, um, it was the 80, 80, 80 rule. You need to uh, make that land available to uh, uh, qualified uh, nonprofits or government agencies to build affordable housing 80% of the time and 80% uh, of income. So that's why they changed and they really changed their approach. And now they're, that's state law, but they see that as a real opportunity. And, uh, you know, they uh, did a, a big development up at Capitol Hill, which was all affordable housing. So that's why it changed. Grace, any other thoughts on that? No, I, the only thing I would add is that the, while it appeared that it was, um, that affordable housing wasn't was prohibited, the, 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 word, the phrase that they used often was, we need to sell for the highest and best value, um, which in their mind precluded um, the development of affordable housing. Um, and to Rick's point, there are, are new legislation and measures in place that, that mandate pretty much um, sound transit, give these sites over to affordable housing. Um, so it's, it's changed dramatically in the last decade. And I think it's a reflection of where sound transit used to be as an agency um, and, and not having a TOD um, strategy to now having you know, staff and, and actually a strategy towards TOD. Um, so it's, it's an evolution of, the, of that agency. Tom Hinkson had a question about what kind of structures did you have to take for the development on Broadway? Um, and I, I think what he meant, meant perhaps was how was the site transferred? And I think from a design perspective, um, the station boxes are there and you had to sort of build around them. Did, any, any more thing you want to add on that, Grace? Yeah, and, I, and maybe I'm not understanding the question quite right, but I, I took it to be that, but also um, if, if it's the legal or, or like site acquisition, it's again, I think the agency has, has evolved, but in that uh, Capitol Hill site, the, the land transfer was actually a ground lease um, mm -hmm. for, the, for the market rate units for I think 99 years. And then the affordable housing site was transferred outright because that was a condition of the funding. Um, so I think at this point, most of the sites that Sound Transit is um, is transferring, um, if it's affordable housing, then it's a it's basically a, a, a free land swap or not swap, a, a land transaction. Um, and and that lower, lower, than, lower than market value too in that, in that regard, <laughs> either ground lease or, or transfer at lower than market value. And maybe uh, Tom, to answer your question, um, on the uh, Brooklyn station, uh, initially, uh, there was interest in uh, uh, the air rights uh, by the University of Washington. And uh, initially, Sound Transit was not going to put in the structures that it would take to build on top of the station boxes. And the University of Washington said, well, then there's no value if you don't pre-build. <laughs> uh, so they, they had to beef up their structures. And that's, uh, I think, there were, um, in the earlier panel that talked about um, some federal grants that might uh, uh, provide some opportunity for some, some structural integrity for future development. So that, that's another uh, potential opportunity there. And if that was the question, the one thing that I will add about Capitol Hill that's a little bit funny is the affordable housing didn't need to have parking. Um, and yet they could not afford to not provide parking because the, the, the weight of the dirt was factored into the, was added to the weight of the building. Um, and when Sound Transit had designed the station boxes, they had assumed that there would be a layer of parking and therefore the lack of dirt there. So that was one of those funny things that we um, were kind of pushed into providing parking. It, it's not actually for the building, it's for the market route building next door. But since we had to excavate anyway, we just excavated across and connected the parking garages. So it added complexity um, and, and maybe it worked out in the end, but it, it definitely added complexity. It helped that we were the architect for both buildings. If we were, we had two separate owners and two separate contractors. So that was still complicated, but, um, but that was a, a unique aspect of the, the original design that Sound Transit had created for 
us to all accommodate later. Well, and, and back to what's ongoing now with Santa Transit 3, um, the engagement with the community and the city and the property owners around the design and alignment of the stations is important. On East Link, uh, there was a developer, Rut Run said in the Spring District, that um, wanted to build around the station. Initially, Sound Transit had a surface alignment, which would have bisected the property, what would not have made for a, for a good uh, a partnership with the private sector. And through a lot of back and forth with the private sector and Sound Transit, they did a retained cut that allowed the developer to, to use the uh, parcel more effectively. And I think there's opportunities for Sound Transit 3 to do the same thing. And I know uh, Sound Transit is gonna do a, a TOD technical study uh, as a separate document uh, after the draft EIS is published, which would allow, again, communities and developers to say, okay, what are the opportunities around the 13 stations on the West Seattle to Ballard? Uh, you know, what are, the, what are the opportunities for the types of development we're talking about right here? Uh, both uh, business uh, and, and housing. So a lot more to be done. And uh, one other comment about uh, Sound Transit's uh, change stance. Um, uh, Speaker Frank Chop was the one who put that legislation forward. And there was a lot of community advocacy around that to sort of change that business model. And it, it really did. And it's, it's, it's made a big difference. I'm looking for any uh, questions I've missed here. Um, Ben, anything I missed on the uh, questions from the uh, audience? I don't see any additional questions in the Q&A, Rick. All right, maybe we should uh, use the last uh, few minutes before we, we turn it back to and any closing comments from our three panel members. Uh, Patrice, I'll start with you. Yeah, um, I have to bring to the forefront um, recognizing and honoring our indigenous communities in this work and in this effort, um, as we are all talking about land here and uh, challenging us to um, just be mindful of that as we think about the many different ways uh, that we all approach this work. I would also like to say, hello, I can't see you, but OPCD colleagues, the Planning Commission, the Design Commission, um, can't see you, but I'm sure you're here. And um, shout out to all of you and your great work. And that's it. And thank you for having me here today. Grace, closing comments? Yeah, um, I guess I would encourage um, TOD proponents, uh, folks that are going to uh, propose on future projects, the agencies that are. Um, in these station areas, um, uh, whether it's the transit agencies or the, um, the city municipal agencies, um, to really um, focus on inclusion. Um, I think instead of thinking about uh, community engagement and inclusion, inclusion of, of all people as um, a challenge or a thing to overcome, if you can really think about it as like the central guiding point, it will make for a more robust and vibrant um, an equitable TOD. Um, I think that's that's an important piece of it. When you when you're always looking at that as a hindrance or a, bit, a challenge or um, you know just um, you know how do you tokenize that involvement? It, it becomes a burden and it, and it and it doesn't feel great. It doesn't look great. Um, I think when you can um, center folks of all backgrounds um, and abilities, it actually will create a much more vibrant and um, in, and holistic uh, community that reflects real people in, in, in real communities. Okay. Um, I would I would add to that, you know, with that that centering of the community, really, really honing in on understanding what it is that the community values. I think that word has come up a lot, value, whether it's financial or um, you know occupational, that sort of thing, you know, what is it that the community wants to keep together? What is it that makes them feel part of the community that they're in and want to stay or even return and, and, add, and add, you know, their talents, et cetera, to that community? Um, I'd also, you know, recommend being, um, you know, nimble, being able to, 
to really work with the community and, and not be entrenched in your idea of what's gonna work. You know, be open to their suggestions, be open to their feedback, and then really, really be patient. You know, starting from as, as both Patrice and Grace have said, from the very beginning, when you know the communities that you need to engage with, be patient with how long that process may take. Well, I want to thank our panels, uh, uh, Patrice, Uche, and Grace, and thank PSRC for hosting uh, this uh, session. They've done this uh, for quite a few years now. And I'm going to turn it back over to uh, uh, David and Ben to talk about the, uh, hopefully you can participate in some of the on-site uh, Tacoma and Linwood and uh, uh, Northgate uh, tours this afternoon. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Rick, and th thank you, Patrice and Uche and Grace for this conversation about the, the deep community engagement and inclusion um, that is, is so critical to the work that we have ahead of us. Um, we really appreciate your time and your, your wisdom. And um, one thing I should also note, Grace is a member of our um, newly relaunched regional TOD committee, and I know she'll be bringing this conversation um, to those upcoming meetings, and it's part of what will be informing our work moving forward. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn things over to David Killingstad from Snohomish County, who is the, uh, the other co-chair of our regional TOD committee, and he'll tell you about some next steps and uh, what we have ahead of us in this afternoon. So thank you all. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, I'm David Killingstad. I'm one of the co-chairs, along with patients on PSRC's Regional TOD Committee. I'm also the Long Range Planning Manager uh, here up here in Snohomish County in our Planning and Development Services Department. Um, boy, a lot of a lot of great uh, questions, a lot of great discussion here in in both of these panels. I don't know about you, but I was taking uh, a, a fair bit of notes. Uh, we we up in Snohomish County are are also uh, involved in Sound Transit Three planning and and planning for light rail around a, a couple of funded stations. So. Uh, some great, great uh, information that uh, I think are great takeaways from this. And, and, and as Ben said, uh, the committee, the TOD committee, um, uh, as we go forward, will likely be incorporating a lot of these topics into our, our work program next year. So um, this is all great stuff that uh, I'm glad we, we were able to kind of push it out in this, in this timely manner here as there's a lot of things going on around the region uh, with regards to TO, TOD. As we heard today, equitable TOD can only be achieved when we bring a diverse set of voices to the table. I think we saw that today in, in the panels and in the, the range of attendees um, and include uh, those most impacted by development in the planning process. At PSRC, we have the Regional TOD Committee, which I mentioned that Pat Patience and I uh, co-chair, um, and it's designed to convene a broad coalition of stakeholders focused on identifying and advancing promising equitable transitory development practices, conducting performance monitoring and supporting local efforts to take equitable TOD from theory to practice. And I would just add that uh, the committee um, is uh, really a, has a broad diverse that was it was intended in its re reformation to bring together both public and private uh, members of the community representing that broad spectrum. Uh, the committee uh, hosts these full day events every year, every other year, I'm sorry, every other year, uh, maybe we should do it every year, these are great, um, to bring together community leaders, industry leaders, and transit lovers to learn from one another, celebrate successes, uh, learn from our missteps, uh, always good to look back and, and take a look at lessons learned. Uh, we hope you'll stay engaged with the regional TOD work. Um, keep your eye out for future webinars and other events uh, be, beyond just the, the events that, uh, that the regional TOD committee might be behind. PSRC does have a lot of other uh, reoccurring webinars uh, that offer you uh, a lot of good information, takeaways to help you in your community or in the work that you're doing. Uh, thanks again to our attendees, all of you that attended. We had uh, good attendance. Uh, big thanks to the panelists uh, and PSRC staff. Um, really wish if we were in person, we could give a big round of applause. So we'll have to give a virtual round of applause to our um, uh, PSRC staff putting this on, as well as to our panelists um, who took time out of their day to, uh, to talk to you and answer your questions. Uh, 
Uh, and to the folks who put together the walking tours uh, coming up here this afternoon, uh, City of Seattle, City of Tacoma, and City of Linwood. Um, also some great on the ground insight into work that's going on uh, on TOD right in three of our communities. An email with information shared at today's webinar will be sent to uh, those of you that registered next week. Uh, there'll also be an opportunity to provide some feedback uh, on this. Uh, we do want to hear about what was from you, what was valuable, um, and what we could do to make, make uh, improvements uh, and make, make this uh, event better in the future. Uh, those of you that are um, looking for continuing uh, for CM credits, they are pending and we'll have more information on that will be coming out from PSRC staff. Thanks again uh, for joining us here this morning. Uh, to those of you who will be heading out into the field, uh, thank you for taking the opportunity to go out and, and take a look at uh, three of these areas and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Nice job.